I was the only person who uh, so far got invited to be in the Lulu group who didn't take my infant or maternal training because she's qualified to teach them. And <laughs> well, I'm going to say that anyway. So, <laughs> and, and she's here to talk to us about a subject near and dear to my heart, which is Apple. So, so, yeah, Carol covered it. I live in Cincinnati and um, I'm an occupational therapist. I work at a children's hospital there for about um, 14 years. And um, I, for eight and a half years, I was in the, the NICU, the neonatal intensive care unit. So that's actually where I learned everything. <laughs> and um, I have the real pleasure of spending eight and a half years watching the heart rate, the respiratory rate, and the oxygen saturation as my hands were on the baby's body. So I learned a lot about homeostasis, the physiologic regulation, a lot about baby behavior, about very subtle behavioral cues, and also, too, just about... Um, some of the things that can happen from a soft tissue perspective with babies. And, and, and mostly at that time, it was the babies who had a lot of med medical procedures or babies who were exposed to very traumatic situations. I was working in a level three nursery. It was an ECMO unit, so it's like the highest level NICU that you can work at, where babies are going through a lot of really traumatic things. I didn't really know about plagiocephaly a lot at that time. I learned about it more when I left the nursery because we don't really see a lot of flat heads in the nursery except for what we used to call the toaster head. Now that's not a very like, positive remark to make about anyone, but what would happen is the babies would be born very, very early and the skull's very thin, and then we get this like really narrow appearance to their head. Because babies inherently, after birth, when they're laying on their back, are not able to lay their head in the middle, and it's not developmentally appropriate either for them to really do this. So they would lay either strongly to one side or the other. And so with gravity and the pressure from the surface, they would get this. I didn't know at the time there was really much that you could do about that, but I was learning about other soft tissue things. So how I came about the play is when I moved into the outpatient realm of working with babies. And I was working with babies who had a diagnosis of normally toward colics. So does everybody know what that is? Let's get that out of the way. Anybody not? Please raise your hand. Okay. You don't. Torticollis is, um, the Latin definition of that is dry neck, W-R-Y. So what it means is that there's something going on with the neck that's causing the neck to want to turn to one side, and maybe, possibly, there are actual restrictions that the baby cannot get to the other side without an extreme amount of discomfort or a biological and a biomechanical disadvantage to the body. So torticollis. Okay, so what happens is that when the baby would, they were turning their heads and their heads were, you know, I already been doing cranial work. And at the time, because um, I've been doing this for about 10 years now, I, I really was sure that using cranial sacral therapy with plagiocephaly would be helpful. I wasn't sure exactly how, you know, so I started experimenting with babies in a very gentle way. But the torticollis was, was usually the, the functional indicator because, believe it or not, Right now, as it stands in traditional like OTPT language, we don't really treat plagiocephaly. Okay, so what we would use is like a compensatory strategy. So you would use positioning, or you would use parent education, or possibly a helmet. Has anybody had experience working with babies with helmets? Raise your hand if you worked with a baby with a helmet. It went really, really high, so I'm doing like a percentage count. Okay, so almost half. Um, and so for those babies that were in the helmet, were you also doing cranial sacral therapy? Yeah. So that's one misconception, too, that even if we use a compensatory strategy to address plagiar subtly, we can't do soft tissue manual therapy. But we can, we absolutely can, and we absolutely should. And the best way to do that together would be to take the helmet off and do it. But there's also a great way to work with babies with their helmets on because you're, you're restricted sometimes and that's just the way it is. I worked with this one family and as persuasive as I am, could not get them to take the helmet off. Like, they were just petrified that something's going to happen with this baby if we take the helmet off. So that happens. And even though we know better, it's just like anything else. We can't always force. Yes? So they're using the helmet to try to correct the head shape? Okay, why are they using the helmet? Yeah, to try to correct the head shape. So the helmet, and we'll talk about this in a minute. Can I pick that up in just a minute? Okay, and that is what I want to say. Um, I want this to be interactive, and I want you to get exactly what you want out of it. I could talk about plagiocephaly for four days. <laughs> and I will, if anyone invites me. 
<laughs> so, you know, that's what I want you to do, though, is you get what you came for. So raise your hand, interrupt me, talk, because I'm going to go through this handout, pretty much. I'm going to follow along, so I have a rational mind. I didn't end up doing a PowerPoint, and I'll tell you why. I heard a little bit of um, evidence that people don't really learn from PowerPoints. So. And then I'm going to be talking technical, so on top of that, I... I just didn't want to deal with it. But I do have a lot of these terms written in here. So if you don't know how to spell something or something seems awful, then just look and see if it's written in here or raise your hand and ask me. So plagiocephaly in the Greek means oblique head. So oblique means, you know, here's a round head, which is the typical presentation of a baby. And oblique meaning that there's something going on with the shape of it. So there's that thing called plagiocephaly, the oblique head. And then there's also brachycephaly. You might know what that is. Yes? Yeah, so it's the back of the head, brachycephaly. So brachycephaly is still like an oblique head, it's just that the back is pushed in. Now, the thing with brachycephaly that's different than plagiocephaly is that it's usually a symmetric compression. Okay? So these kids, when they go to the clinics of plagiocephaly, they go to their pediatrician, and the pediatrician doesn't really look at them from the top, or they don't look at them from, from, from you know, the sides, we'll see nothing going on. Because there's a completely symmetric face, there's a completely symmetric, you know, the head looks rounded, sometimes it'll look too rounded, you know, because it's been pushed up, but not really so much worried about it. But it's still an oblique head, it, but it is a little bit of a different classification, we do call it that. There's other, like, scaphocephaly. Has anybody heard of that term? Dolcocephaly. Those are usually terms used for a very elongated head, and that's usually associated um, a lot of times with um, some kind of cranial synostosis. Does anybody know what that is? Yeah. So that's actually where the sutures truly do fuse. Um, and a lot of times there are sutures that are never meant to fuse. Because sometimes sutures fuse that, they fuse early, that really do fuse, like the metopic suture. You know, the, the frontal bone's in two pieces, and here we have our metopic suture. That's wide open usually, all the way from the anterior front now, all the way down to the nose and babies. And this is, should be a very patent suture. And so, um, you know, this suture can close really early. And I've actually worked with a fair amount of babies that at least I would call it sticky here. And, you know, and, and the baby's appearance at birth, a lot of times they look like this. You know, everything's kind of crumped in on here. And that's just a part of that, okay? That's just a big part of how that starts. So that will fuse. But in cranial synostosis, because they won't automatically release a metopic suture. They're like, well, just fuse it. No, we do. It's not going to have anything to do with the brain growth. Although sometimes they will, and I'm working with a baby right now who they're getting ready to do, and I'll maybe update you at the next conference on this kid, a complete cranial reconstruction. Wow. How old is he? He is 11 and a half months. We'll see. Okay. <laughs> I'm in it with him for whatever it takes, okay? Here we go. Mm -hmm. So it's an oblique head. It's an asymmetric head shape. So even if they have brachycephaly and they're symmetric, it's still like, from what I would consider an anterior posterior asymmetry, okay? And um, there's different types. So one is the deformational. This is usually caused, you know, like, like after birth, usually. Okay, so that the baby's laying in a certain position and the weight of their head from gravity and they're on a flat surface. And um, usually what's also associated with this, and we won't really talk a lot about that right now, is there's just less motor movements in general with babies who will develop this and propensity for it. So that's kind of an influencing factor too. And there's also the, the Back to Sleep campaign, which started about 1992. And, hey guys, guess what? At the same time that they did the Back to Sleep program, they also had the Tummy to Play program. So they were really introduced at about the same time. But there's a whole lot of emphasis around dying babies. <laughs> so the Back to Sleep campaign gets a lot more kind of attention. And believe it or not, there has been about a 40% decrease in SIDS since the Back to Sleep program. So we will honor that in all intentions and mercy. But at the same time, the tummy to play is extremely, extremely important. And it's kind of gotten pushed on the back burner. And um, I'm going to talk a lot about tummy time a little bit because that's my favorite thing to talk about for sure. Then there's other types like intrauterine. So those are like intrauterine constraints. Okay, Whatever happens if they're developing, and I've worked with several mothers who have a double uterus. Everybody knows about that. I had no clue. Like, you have a what? You have a, you have a who? And I met one mother who has two cervixes. I don't know how. I just I was like, okay. I believe you. I don't know. 
how that happens, but I guess you know, we're all a little bit different, okay? So that can be, or there's like big fibroids. I work with a couple of uh, babies who, they were in the womb, not with their twin playing, but they were playing around with their fibroids, you know? And, and so there just wasn't a lot of space on that. Um, I, uh, my, another entry due to constriction is two of my very dear friends are Pilates instructors, and they're pulled to the floor, and their abs are the best in the world. They look hot, right? But when it came time to grow a big baby, they weren't able to really let that happen, okay? So it made for a lot of entry due to Straight. And they both had boys, and we all know that boys need more help in general, sorry. And um, that they're less flexible, and that they have more of a propensity to develop pudgecephaly in the first place. And I'll just make one statement that I've been doing outpatient OTPC for a while now, and probably 85% of our clients are boys. We'll move on. Why? Why? <laughs> well, I have a theory. Um, but one is just that um, males are bigger and they're less flexible. That's just my theory, and maybe they're a little less resilient. I don't know exactly, but I do know, yes. Well, and then the testosterone during development in the, in the womb causes more disability that's more unstable. I like that. That's good. That's awesome. I love that. <laughs> um, and then there's the perinatal birth trauma group, you know, where um, there's some, something happens at or around the time of birth, and this could be, it doesn't have to be a physical event, it could be a psychological event. Okay, so if something happens at or around the time of birth or during the birth, okay? And so um, there's that. And, and we say, what could that be? That could be anything you can imagine. We just name one thing, okay? So we all know. And then there's the congenital. And those kids really get kind of their own separate category because. You know, a lot of times there's a genetic component to it, and there's a syndrome, or there's just something going on that um, makes it a little bit different than just other types of pleochocephaly. Okay, we'll move on. So the factors, I'm going to talk a little bit about the factors that influence you know, each one. And I talked a little bit about the male sex, the head preference to one side, and then I said possibly a center. If you meet a baby in the first, like, two or three weeks of life who likes to lay with their head in the center, Please work with that baby and laying with their head. We get, you know, at, really ask them to move. And really because we know the intimate structures of the head, neck, and shoulder and how we need connective tissue to be stretchy and everything. And by the way, if, if every baby did this biological nursing thing, it would probably cut down the deformational pleasure stuff by probably 75%. Because if you notice that the positioning and the pecking and the hunting and the lack of head support all will recruit their natural head and neck riding reactions with are they available for them. I really appreciate Meg saying that. And that it really actually makes our babies more resilient humans to utilize the natural instincts that they've been given to do what they need to do. Okay? So that baby who's actually gotten their what I call chutzpah of being a baby, right? <laughs> more so than the baby who's overprotected and over supported and over over everything. Um, this vision challenges are huge with deformational plagiocephaly because we all have like a dominant eye, a dominant nasal, a dominant ear, a dominant extremity. That they'll either, I mean, babies will, I mean, you can't say, if, if I have a head preference to the right, you can't tell me that it's definitely my left eye that's dominant. Because, like we were talking about before, babies don't really use their vision a ton early on. But it could be this eye that they're looking there. But they do have this, you know, short range vision, which is usually from your nipple to your face. Okay. And so, but that is, is more of a factor in, in the next few weeks of life. Reflux is a huge reason for deformation of life because the reflexors will go the right. They'll be over, and, and they'll be like this. And, and they're the babies that love to stand. Why do they go the right? I don't know. You know the right and left vagus nerve actually kind of do different things, and they're like kind of wired a little bit differently. You know the vagus nerve, the cranial nerve, one or the vagabond. My favorite thing, besides the pleasure stuff we have so many times to talk about, is it's a huge part of, really, it's, it's, it's it for babies, is the tenth cranial nerve. And so it enters the airway. It's our airway. It has the, it has the input to the sinoatrial node. It has impact on our gut. It, everything. So it's good. Neurologic integrity. Right, so we all understand that. Sleeping positions, go back to sleep. So usually that's the biggest thing. Because what will happen is we'll, we'll work with babies 
and we do our wonderful work, and they come to our office, and we get soft tissue restrictions, and they go home and sleep for eight hours in the back room, and everything's like that. And nothing ever quite goes back the way, because we're actually making changes in the collagen with our work. And, um, but it does go back and just reinforce that muscle memory, the connective tissue memory for that physician. And it doesn't take away our work, but... <gasps> so you've got to talk to parents about you know, sleeping positions and making sure, like, hey, you know what? I love the fact that your baby loves to look to the right, because that's going to be really important. And then also, let's work on the left side, because the baby, we want the baby to be able to, to find this left side of the world. Really important thing. And, and you can almost sometimes I even act like this might be the first time I've said that. <laughs> <laughs> okay, the other thing is, to, yes. Do you think, I, I've often thought about this, do you think that there's <coughs> one of the reasons why there is right-sided orientation is because a lot of babies present LOA? Yes. Mm -hmm. I don't so it's definitely, there's definitely a, a what would you call it, a norm for how babies present? Yeah, I think it's probably another good one. That's a good one. And then the other thing is the reciprocal tension membrane. Okay, so I want to tell you guys something that I think is the coolest thing in the whole world, right? Is that, um, you know, the reciprocal tension membrane, does everybody know what I'm talking about when I say that? Okay, so the reciprocal tension membrane is an old term used by the old osteopaths for the, the dural system. So basically what it is is it's the dura, Right? And it's invaginations, and it's wrap around the front of the magnum, and it's dropped down to S2. Guess what, guys? It's a peace sign. <laughs> <laughs> it's the holographic nature of the universe. Whoa. We're all about peace inside. <laughs> okay. So what happens is that this is the fox. This is this is the fox cerebrae and cerebelli. And this is the tent. This is the frame of magnum, and where it's not actually closed there, I just have it because it's wrapped around the frame of magnum. It's a hole, right? And it drops down, and it's just on S2, second sacral segment. Which, if we remember really, really closely, that the sacrum itself is really just a cartilaginous zone. There's very, I mean, and actually, that's where some of the first ossification can actually happen, but it's still, there's still individual vertebral segments. So if you've got a kid that has deformational plagiocephaly and they have it and they and they're liking to turn to one side, there is most definitely going to be a pull down here on, on the pelvis. So all the stuff we learned this morning is going to be extremely important <coughs> to blend with our treatment of plagiocephaly. Okay? Good. <clears throat> I want to mention just for one that a congenital anomaly that can happen when we're working with plagiocephaly, we do need to have our our to it is something called clypophile. Has anybody heard of that? What is it? Clypophile. It's a hyphenated word. It's in your notes. And it's a, um, it's a fusion of the cervical vertebrae. So anywhere between two and seven, really. And one or two or three or more can be involved. And there can also be an associated sprangles deformity where the cervical vertebrae actually attach to the scapula. And I've worked from a couple of kids with this, too. So, um, you know, like, what's the outcome? You know, the little girl, we, we started doing cranial work with her when she was, they were going to, we're going to do surgery, and we're going to be, everybody's excited about her. It's like, then they said, let's just try OT for a while. So we did OT, because they thought we would work on the shoulder, right? And that's what we did, did a lot of weight-bearing and, and OT-ish things. But then I was doing cranial cycle therapy with her, too, and then they kept postponing the surgery, and kept postponing the dragon. What are they going to detach the scapula from the cervical vertebrae? I didn't really care a whole lot, except for I just I wanted a little bit more mobility. Well, they didn't end up doing it because we got so much mobility everywhere else, and she was so functional. They just didn't do it, which is fine. Um, and then other embryologic mutations. So everybody's heard of oligo hydrangeos and poly hydrangeos. Um, when you have too little fluid, that can be a congenital reason. That's another, like, is it a constraint issue or is it a congenital issue? I don't know. Just be aware of it. Okay, that's just another factor. Multiple gestation, that can be a focus. It's the much higher significance of plagiocephaly with multiple gestation babies. And then, of course, the breach and transverse lie are the most indicated for having a cranial mold. Birth trauma is like sunny side up, C-section, either you know, a medicated versus an unmedicated birth. Forceps, vacuums. Is anybody using a vacuum still where you are? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. No, 35%. Yeah. 
for the brain to develop optimally, you need pressure on the surface of the body. And what's perfect is the baby's weight and gravity. Okay? And sometimes it's not gravity, because when the mom's like this, there's not so much gravity. But it's no good deal, because they're putting their, their body weight against mom. And also, mom's going, or dad, which is putting more pressure on you. So that's absolutely huge, that if we're in swings and car seats and on our back, we're not getting enough pressure. We're getting all the pressure back here, so we have the body and its infinite wisdom setting up all these compensatory strategies. Okay, and it's laying, and here's the cranial base, here's the little occiput, the sphenoid, and here they've got this relationship. And the occiput's in how many pieces, guys? Tell me. Four. Four. And the temporal bone's in how many pieces, guys? Three. And the frontal bone's in? Two. And the sphenoid's in? Three. Three. Yes. Very good. You guys are good. <laughs> okay, so what this means is we have a whole lot more sutures than we think. We have a whole lot more area. And the cranial vault itself, I mean, you know, here we got, <clears throat> this, is, this is the base, and then this is the cranial vault. So basically up here. The cranial vault is actually, you know, it's, it's embryologically designed. They actually derive from two different types of tissues embryologically. This head is actually designed to fold in over itself and then open up. Okay, so that's a kickstart mechanism for <clears throat> opening up the cranial base too. So that's why C-section babies will sometimes have more phlegocephaly than other. They didn't really ever get that squeezing. But this will be the kid. I teach baby yoga classes, and this is not the type of yoga where mom is doing yoga and she's holding the baby. This is where we're actually putting the baby through a yoga class. And it's a whole lot of fun. But um, I forgot where I was going with that, though. I'll remember it. Pardon? You're talking about premature connection with more pleasures at work. Yeah, so I'm not getting it. You were talking about the, the focus on the back body. Oh, yeah. Pressure on one side. Yeah, so. Um, I still don't know where well, you're going. Well, it's your memory. Yes, but I still don't know where you're going. Something going on. Concentrate <laughs> strategies. It'll um, come back. <laughs> um, the other thing is obtrusive handling and removing from mom's presence. Now, I, I don't know exactly why, why this is a bigger factor, but I do know that I think that the removal from the mom's presence is just one of those things that shuts down the neurological system. I mean, I think the babies, you know, it just so wonderful that she's like, we understand the baby needs to be here the whole time it's developing, but that it can be in its bed 25 feet from the mom and, and, and think that's okay when the baby in that first year of life is really in a symbiotic relationship with the mom. And really, the moms can't be out of three feet space because they, they sense the removal of that. And so it's almost like having, you know, your phone actually plugged in and it's charging or it's just sitting halfway into there and the, the bars aren't really going up. Okay, so being removed from mom, I think, causes the baby just have a neurologic depression. And a lot of times that's with the medicates. It's like you see it with the medicated birth at the same time. Okay. <coughs> so we talked about the presentations already. Now the implications, and I say I'm pontificating here, but I'm really not. Every single one of these, except for inadequate or atypical CSFO, came from a peer-reviewed journal article in the medical literature. Okay, so I'm really not pontificating, and um, I think all of these are valid reasons, because what we're, we're trying to make a case for why we should use something to treat plagiarism, like because right now we don't treat it, we just find ways to help it out, compensatory strategies. So I'm trying to make a case at the hospital where I work that doing something, it, we, we do have something that we can do. And, but the one thing is, and this is why I was very, very interested in the whole role of the chin, uh, with, with the biological nurse, nursing because mandibular <coughs> asymmetry is huge. So we got not only that, but TMJ issues and then teeth problems. Because you know when we're babies, we have not only our baby teeth, but all of the, the process for our adult teeth as well. And that really, our gums are like uh, kind of soft tissue, these bones that are getting ready to pop through. So mandibular asymmetry, there is always a mandibular asymmetry with plagiocephaly. <coughs> 100% of the time. And, and even in babies that don't have plagiocephaly, that have a little bit of torcollis, which is the right neck thing, there's always a mandibular asymmetry. And then on top of that, you'll see kids who don't have torcollis and don't have a head preference and don't have plagiocephaly, and they still have a mandibular asymmetry. Well, this is because it's the only single impaired bone with articulation on the right and side of the body. And as we explained to us this morning, we're not perfectly symmetrical creatures, and it's going to take 
a lot of you know the shifting and the cranium. Because if you imagine in plagiocephaly, <laughs> what happens is that, and I'm going to pass these around so you can look at these. I'm going to start doing that now. Is that the whole entire thing gets shifted forward? So if you have the back of the head and you get one side shifted forward, because the, because the head is really a closed kinematic chain in a way, um, you have to get movement somewhere else. Okay, so there's not just compression that happens in the flat side. There's all this adjusting that has to happen around in the cranium. So what will happen inevitably, unless there's a cranial synostosis, is that the temporal bone will shift forward. Mm -hmm. And a lot of times, this will cut, we'll get what's called frontal bossing, where you know here's the metopic suture, and this part of the frontal bone begins to come out, and so this part of the forehead actually looks like, and it is, in a different spot on the left side. And sometimes it's just a little brown bulb. So um, you need to produce really good palpation. We're going to talk about that in a minute and figure that out. If you see a baby that has um, like a right side plagiocephaly, so this side is flat, and you're expecting this temporal bone to go which way? Forward. Forward. If it goes backward, you need to send them to the plastic surgeon because that's a synostotic. That is not, is not moving. The cranium is not moving. So that's a really good thing because normally if you get a, sh a shove this way, you need to see the temporal bone go this way. And not always will that frontal bone go because there's too much uh, variability happening. Sometimes this will go. You just want to note it. Okay, you just want to make really good notes about where you see the bossing. There's there's three different places, yes? Are you, are you saying then that a true synostosis cannot be correct in the cranium? Wow. <laughs> <He's> on <laughs> tape. <Whoa>. No. <laughs> well, it's just important to cover your butt. It's just important to be a savvy person and refer on and get some more opinions. The plastic surgeon is going to do what they want to do, which is operate. Exactly. And if that's not needed? Well, I don't know that I would say that I'm at the point in my life that I would say that it's not needed. Okay. Yeah. Um, it's, a, it's a good one because, like, well, what do they do if they're sitting on stosis? Well, they get their saws out. And Are they still doing it? Oh, yeah. Still oh, yeah. 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 But let me tell you something, guys. Synostosis is very rare. Yeah. Yeah. And synostosis of a viable suture that doesn't truly close, like a non, like not a metopic suture, and not the uh, not the squamous portion of the oxygen. I'm not telling you about all those other suture lines because these bones are broken up in pieces. That's usually where there will be some stickiness because those are all ready, ready to fuse into one bone. So for that type, I wouldn't necessarily be big about sending them to a doctor. Okay? How do you tell the difference? Um, uh, some of it's experience. So if you don't have experience, I would say be very careful and make the referral. Mm -hmm. um, I would say that um, experience is it. But right now, if you really, if you re if you see a baby that has right side of the plagiocephaly and this is all going in, refer them on. It's just really important because there, there could be something else going on that we just don't understand. And usually that's the key. Yeah. Because I was I I was told that I had a
Would you feel, from a cranial perspective, just decreased movement there? Quite a bit of, I mean, how? You mean if it's, if it's really true? Yeah, if it's a really referral sticky. situation. Yeah, I mean, the tissue feels different. It feels bigger, thicker, bulkier. I would treat it several times, maybe okay. four to six before you made up your mind. It's, hey, stomatosis is very rare. Even in kids who have diagnoses of certain things, it's very, very rare. So you probably didn't really have it. It was probably just a sticky spot. And this, you know, there, I have a good article from a, a complimentary, I think it's the Body Work Journal, that tells exactly, like, with manual therapy, there's actual, you know, that shows the collagen changing. And collagen is that really, really thick part of it. You know, the elastin is the rubber band, stretchy. If you pull it, it go, it goes back. Collagen, when you stretch it on the right type of, you know, it'll actually lengthen and stay that way. Okay? I don't want to get too caught up in that, guys, because it's really, there are very few kids who have, you know, a synostatic. I'm going to send this around so you can start to see some MRIs. Well, that means that the surgery is being done on babies who could be corrected with babies. Not very often. Not where I'm from. So we do that with the end when your parents were like, How old are you? Right now. Right now? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so 33 years ago, they probably were doing things a little bit differently. Yeah, they're not as um, they're not as young to about that. I will tell you about one case study that's getting written, written up in a medical journal I was involved in. And unfortunately, they're not going to mention physical therapy. They're not even going to mention occupational therapy. They're going to call it this is, this is fine and okay with me because I don't care. I know what happened with this kid. This kid was um, he had. You may have heard the, the term wormy in bones. Yeah. 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 So we're like, what, what's a wormy bone? And if you were, you know. In the no, you know that it's like a little island in the, in the, there's like, you know, the suture line. Let me find a good place, a good picture of that. <coughs> um, I don't have a good picture of the one even that would have been good to go. But say you have the occiput here, and there's a parietal and the temporal bone. Inside the suture line, there's this little bitty tiny, tiny island bone. Well, he had like two or three along the coronal suture, and he had several along the suture too. So they went in, and this was a kid who, it was, there was a lot of molding and a lot of draw to the right, and, and really it was very significant. So they went in, and they put in springs. They put springs in this suture, two sets of them, and then they spliced this one open and did a cadaveric implant. What's that? Um, from a cadaver. Oh. Put healthy tissue there. Somewhat healthy tissue. <laughs> <laughs> Dead healthy tissue. <laughs> it got a massive infection. Mm -hmm. And it opened up and pussed and smelled and blah, 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 all this other stuff happened. So they had to go in and take it all out. And so then they had to put stuff other back in because, you know, he was going to have a problem with his cranium at this point and taking the springs out and put the springs back in. This kid was 14 months by the time he got to me. He'd been in physical therapy for a while, and I work really closely with physical therapists, and they know me, and occasionally, you know, we all get buddy-buddy, we get together, we collaborate on the kid, but sometimes they wait, it's okay. And I'm like, oh my God, you see this kid, no one can even touch his head, which is why we haven't really referred him to you, because he's going to go crazy. And um, it was fine, and I worked with this kid, and we did a lot. I mean, I, have my, I think I learned more from that kid than I've learned from anybody my whole entire life. I mean, he just looked the whole right side of his head, the whole fascial system, how everything felt. He, not only that first treatment session, was joyful and very glad for the input. Now, he did, he did end up, you know, the second and third session kind of having his thing, you know. And, but there was a lot to cry about, and there was a lot going on. I'm explaining to the parents about you know, emotions and just uh, traumatic experiences and, and releasing that. But that first session was like, oh. <laughs> And I don't really like to have a good session like that sometimes because then they start projecting onto you, right? Of you being the hero, of you actually doing something, of you actually having holding the key to what they think they need. And it makes the relationship really tense, okay? So um, that's a good one. But um, anyway, so he had, he had such a good outcome from doing fascial therapy. I said, please, would you please do the go over? Let them know that he's been getting craniosacral therapy. Would you just please tell them he's gotten six sessions of craniosacral therapy and that you're insistent that this is when you saw these big changes happen. So they went over there and they pulled over. And they're like, yeah, 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 okay. And then, um, so he's getting written up in the medical journal as this really good outcome. And they're not going to mention everything that happened. They are going to mention the therapy happened. They're not going to say what. So we're, we're like getting closer, right, <laughs> into the medical profession to say that, number one, there is a reason to treat plagiocephaly. And um, not only that, but it can be treated very effectively using these 
soft tissue manual therapy techniques. Okay? So visual motor, ocular problems, strabismus, and astigmatism, those are almost always seen in kids with plagiocephaly. And, um, you know, does everybody know what nystagmus is? Well, it's the shaking back and forth of the eyes. Now, we all have it, actually. All of us right now have a little bit of it. It's so fine that we're not really noticing it, and we kind of correct for each other's asymmetries. Until when? Until we get somebody on the body book table and we look from the top down, and then we can see everybody's asymmetries. <laughs> so it's really good. Um, ear problems, vestibular processing problems. Why would it be plagiocephaly, like one side shifted to the other, cause vestibular processing problems? In the temporal. Yeah. So you've got these two little kind of receptors, you know, which are all these coils and cool little instruments in your inner ear that are telling you, you know, how we're flying the plane, and all of a sudden, everything shifted. Now, we're resilient, we're adaptive, we'll organize around that. But guess what that does? It throws our sensory systems into whack. And it gets us used to adjusting for that. And then we'll set up all of our muscle memory and all of our vestibular processing memories based on that. And so when we, the good cranial sacral practitioner, come along and we really help them and it shifts, they are feeling like they're nauseous and throwing up in our roller coaster ride. Okay, so a little bit of that, I'll tell the parents, you know, sometimes we're working with this, you know, even though it's very gentle, <coughs> even though it's very safe, the baby may be processing this as if it's a wild ride. It just depends. I mean, it depends on the parent how it would word it. The other thing is, um, there's always, and here we got the occiput, and here we got the sphenoid. So if anything happens at the occiput here, it's going to have an effect on the sphenoid. Does everybody understand that? Now, here's the sphenobasilar synchondrosis. It's kind of a lot more rubbery than it is later on. And I guess they do say that this truly does you know, get really, really hard. I'll say that. I wouldn't say it to you. It's the part of that bar. You know, by the time about like, 25 or so. But um, very, very mobile in babies. But what will happen is, invariably, it'll tilt the side bend, it'll get a torsion, something will happen. And um, that can be a problem. Why? There's a couple of nerves that go through there. A couple of nerves. A couple of nerves. <laughs> <laughs> and our eyes are visual processing centers. And like we were learning earlier about, you know, four, six, seven, eight weeks, babies are using their eyes a lot. Okay, by the time you're 12 months old, you have fully adult vision. Do you know that? Now, our eyes are at 12 months old. It's almost fully adult vision. As far as like depth perception, and, and uh, they may not be able to talk about the beautiful mountains, but they can you know, somewhat see them. So it's really, it's a quick process, our visual processing that does happen. But if they're at all off, we're going to be injected. We're going to have this, this concept of the horizon, right? And then babies will look like this because they're adjusting to the horizon. They need to have that telling them good. And now we've got a persistent tilter. Now we've got strain patterns being set up along the left side of the body and an elongation pattern on this side. Okay? So it can be a big problem also to with visual processing, not just vestibular processing. Facial asymmetry, facial scoliosis. I've seen lots of babies that, I mean, you'll see a baby that will be more at risk for, for plagiocephaly, especially deformational plagiocephaly, if they have a facial asymmetry. So anytime you take advantage of when a baby's crying, check it out. That's what I'm looking at when they've been crying. I'm not worried about calling them down. I want to see is what the, world, the tongue doing, the jaw, the mouth, the face, the eyes, the forehead, everything. Okay. Facial scoliosis. Who's heard that term before? I know. Isn't that beautiful? Yeah. <laughs> it's in the literature. Connective tissue balances. We know this, especially in the neural membrane system. Anytime you've got a big asymmetry, the body's going to set itself up around that. So you're going to get postural imbalances. You're going to get um, different kind of weight shifting patterns, et cetera. You're going to get a baby that doesn't love to be on their what? Yeah. Um, inadequate or atypical CSF flow. Well, how is that? Okay, here's a trivia question. Does the CSF contact the dura? Yes or no? Does the CSF contact the dura? Where is the CSF, guys? Inside. Where inside? I mean, the dura is one layer. We've got three. It's the outermost layer, dura, mater, tough, mother, is what that's, you know that in Latin. Tough mother is what dura, mater means. I love that. Isn't it? 
also in the subarachnoid space. The fluid is in the subarachnoid space, guys. So it does what? So it does contact it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's like that. I mean, it's like that. It's I mean, if you want to consider that there's a superior surface to the arachnoid space, no, it doesn't contact the dura. Because it's pocketed. And there's a little arachnoid, you know, like it looks like a spider where arachnoid comes from. And then it has its own surface. And then what's under that? Yeah, yeah. yeah which goes all, I mean, there's like this little thin, wispy, uh, sort of contiguous with all the jaw of the brain. The arachnoid layer and the dura are not following the gyri of the brain. They are not following all the imaginations of the brain. Except for the imaginations are the dura. So all the fluids in the subarachnoid space, you get a flattening, you get compression there, there's less fluid. Now the brain usually, I would say usually, I would say hardly ever is truly damaged by plagiocephaly because there's a lot of space in there. The brain itself is not. But what can be the neurological Thing is that the nerves, and it's usually the cranial nerves, which means the cranial base and all of that. So there's less cerebral spinal fluid in the area where there's flattening. So you're getting less flow, less circulation, less cleaning. Everybody here just recently, um, Carol, I think, posted it too, with the CSF, we're really talking about not just the brain to drain anymore. It's not just that clear fluid that one of us has to see if someone had meningitis. It's actually a huge part, it's like its own lymph system, you know, and it has a, it has a, effects um, not only on nutrition and waste removal and protection of the brain, but actually how it all functions together. It's exciting, exciting news. Okay? Good stuff. Oral motor feeding issues. That makes a lot of sense because we talked about mandibular asymmetry, we've got inner ear problems, and you know there are some babies who pay, swallowing is painful because when we swallow, when we suck, it helps to open up our eustachian tubes and our ears drain into our throats, okay? So as they're sucking and pumping and pulling, it's painful sometimes because his ears all crumped up, right? And may, may I say that it isn't just oral motor, it's a sensory sucking problem. We have disturbances at the brain stem level. Yeah, and that's a completely even, that's another issue. But yeah, I mean, I'm just talking just biomechanical, just like, just this one thing, but absolutely the sensory piece of it is is uh, the most important part. And I think both with the station tubes, I think we see with those babies who can never settle into a deep sleep, they're always waking themselves up when they're flat and their station tubes are more horizontal. Like they want to pop their ears on an airplane and you get these babies who are waking, waking. They can never really get into a deep sleep. And that's what I see. That's beautiful. Thank you for articulating that. I wholeheartedly agree. The other one, don't be all mad at me now. Perceived attractiveness. Okay. It's important for our social skills and for our interaction with others that um, we appear similar. And anything greater than the five millimeter um, asymmetry, up to ten, especially ten millimeter difference, is significantly different. You're perceived as less attractive. Okay, and it sounds superficial, but it's really not. Okay. How we are viewed by the outside world often becomes the story of how we're viewed on the inside. I'm not saying that's right. Okay, I'm just saying that's the way it is. The biggest thing I notice with that is the affective responses. So um, tagging on with what Allison said with the sensory brain and cranial nerves, those are all, like the vagus nerve is also, did you know, it's our love nerve? And it's also responsible for most of our facial expressions and, and the expression of our facial expressions, not the actual muscle activation, I think some of that's the facial nerve and all these other things. But facial expressions and affective responses are really in the of the cephaly. Because you got too much pressure in there. And I could go into a lot, like, you know, here we got three major cranial nerves coming out of the jugular parina. So that's between the occiput and the temporal bones. And also, too, do you know in that little jugular foramen of those three cranial nerves, one of which is the, is the vagus nerve, which is, the, in my, my opinion, one of the most important ones. And also, too, the jugular vein, which drains 85% of the venous drainage from our head. We're all sharing space here. So the body is going to mute sensory feedback and information from the brainstem to drain the head. It's just, it's just how, how we're set up to live. So that's another implication. These are all reasons why we should be treating it, right? 
There's a developmental delay. So they started doing research. Well, should we treat fully disabled because kids are developmentally delayed? Well, they started looking. We got excited. Yes, they're developmentally delayed. Yes, 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 yes. Until they're 18 months, and then most, for the most part, are caught up. Gross motor skills, fine motor skills. But what I'd like to say about being caught up developmentally and having fully disabled is that you're not really caught up because your sensory integration has definitely some processing problems and maybe some very, very serious processing problems. And that's one big thing, because that's mostly how we'll end up living our life. But two, it's the quality with which we do our developmental skills. Well, yeah, he can jump, but does anybody notice what it looked like? <laughs> <laughs> he can feed himself. Has anyone watched him in a restaurant? <laughs> you know, so there's these things that you can do, and then it's muted and hindered. And it doesn't, you know, anything that doesn't allow our full expression, what does the nice nice says? Well, the pain to stay in a bud was uh, overcome by the risk it took to blossom. You know, that's what we're really doing with these kids, is like really just seeing what it is to have their full expression. And even though they're caught up, there's something going on because this whole system is, is not in, in place. And I, I'm terrible because when I had my peace sign out here, I didn't talk about the reciprocal tension membrane exactly, but having that as the whole in your hands. Okay, we're going to talk about that when we talk about treatment. The reciprocal tension membrane is that whole thing that I showed you with the peace sign. So it just means that there's a whole way that it's, uh, it's extrapolating itself. And we know that the cranial word is like expansion, which we call what? Flexion. Flexion. And then? Extension. Extension, which is contraction. So it's like that's kind of like the flow of life for things to expand and contract. That's kind of how everything in life works. Okay, so we definitely know that that's not happening when you have plagiocephaly. <laughs> so that will, even though the appearance of the head will change over time a little bit with developmental skill maturation, you will get a little bit less flattening. There's still not this full <clears throat> expression. And then you get the kids who end up with hyperactivity. I think there's a cause because there's just so much tension in, in the cranial base and the occiput, the way the occiput is sitting on C1, its relationship to even just the first three cervical vertebrae can have a big effect on how the kids express themselves. Okay? So the development of leg can still be, and then they did the Bailey, which is a, a standardized assessment on kids at toddler age. And you know, they were still showing, you know, 18 months, they were still showing developmental delays, but then they couldn't really say it was de definitely due to the plagiocephaly, because they say all these other risk factors are you know, low mobility, you know, these kids never really moved a lot in the first place, and that's what they're blaming. They're saying it's really a neurologic problem. Um, instead of seeing it as like the whole membrane and how the nerves are functioning, more of a fu functional structural approach. Okay. Nasal, oh, a avenue of expression challenges. Okay, so um, some of this came out of the animal literature, which is fine, I can do that. Um, <laughs> that they looked at dogs who had like a shorter anterior posterior, like pugs and bulldogs and stuff, and they found, you know, they have definitely brachycephaly, right? <laughs> and they looked, and they said their, their pharyngeal dimensions were different, and they had a higher incidence of snoring and central apnea. Of course. Okay? So we can't always lay over animal literature on humans, but that makes sense, doesn't it? If you've got something pushing in your occiput and you have something super important like the brain stem there, super important like major cranial nerves and the jugular vein, something really important like the spinal cord, that, that compression you know, cause, can cause some problems. Now, back to sleep, compression of that, and story, central apnea, does compute why back to sleep has helped so much, right? So we need to look at why back to sleep has really been helpful, and one, I think, is awareness. We just brought everybody's awareness to it, so that decreased and stuff automatically, okay? And then you also think, too, well, you've got pressure on the back of the head, hopefully not completely in midline, which is like the most dangerous part. But that's why babies really need to have it to the side, because here, you're going to get a lot of compression up in here, and then over here, you're going to get some compression over here. And, and actually, compression in the skull is good. It's not a bad thing. And you'll see, oh, I know what I was saying earlier. I see in my kids in my baby yoga class that they're like four months old, and we get them in a pose, okay, and here we are, and the baby goes like this. It pushes themselves up with their head. And they're all like, oh my god, Michelle, look. And I say, was your baby born in C-section? <laughs> <laughs> Did you tell me your baby was born in C-section? Sometimes the babies will get themselves, here we go with their own unique expression, in places where they get the pressure and they needed it in the vaginal delivery. 
if we'll let them do it. And our hands are taught to follow the tissue, right? So we'll follow a baby's movements, and I find that a lot that babies really want that pressure in their head. And it's all dictated by their own system. I would never come in and arbitrarily affect pressure in the head. But I will follow that, okay, and move that out. Breathing difficulties, asthma, snoring, soft tissue in the throat, immune system. So um, how does it affect the immune system? Well, a whole lot, number one, because um, we found that uh, babies that have more stress hormones have lower immune systems. And uh, we just find that babies that have more compression and more tightness and lack of mobility have more stress hormones circulating in their saliva. Okay? And just repetitive stress and trauma. And also, too, it's almost like having an old injury. You're like constantly working with it. You just have to work harder. You just have to work more. Your body has to compensate more. So it draws the resources away from those self-healing mechanisms. Okay. Nasal ethmoid, okay, they found that uh, in babies that have plagiocephaly or in people that have plagiocephaly, at the root of the nose, okay, was laterally deviated to the non-affected side. And also the vomer and the midline were, the vomer and the ethmoid were out of midline. Hmm. So we already know that these, um, these midline structures that have a lot to do with not only our second year following our baby, Stuff, but just the whole middle of the head is shifted over to one side, and usually the non affected side. All right, so here we go to the fun stuff. What questions do you guys have? Have I adequately described what it is? <laughs> yes. Um, in your experience, around what time do you start seeing that good push out to really good, good cranial like, shift on those temporal occipital? Because you know you do all this work for a couple of months, and then all of a sudden they're they're like, oh, I'm not really sure. But then sometimes I see these babies at like you know 10 months, and then at 14 months, and it's like boom, they're they're popped out. What time? What about what time do you start seeing the the? Do, does anybody know? What mm-hmm. do you know like popped out? out? Do you mean it looks like, like it's corrected? <laughs> yes, it's correcting. Yeah. A certain point. Um, it's different with every kid, and it, it, it depends on their development. It depends on, actually, you know what it really depends on? Their tummy time. Okay, so tummy time, why is it so important? Well, you know, everybody knows, um, I'll go ahead and talk about tummy time right now. How about that? So every, this is the surface right here, okay? So everybody knows that when babies are born, their butts are up, and, and they're like this, and, and their hands are close to their face, and they're putting, their, their primary weight-bearing surface in this position is their face. Which is another reason why it really helps nursing because it, the jaw gets really used to being pressed in and everything's opening up and it lets everything just open up. Okay, and it lets the back just feel free and it gives this, this ventral support, which is what we call proprioceptive input. And that's what the brain uses to develop. So if we don't get enough pressure on the front of our body, we just simply won't develop those sensory nerve endings as well. Those muscles will not be as connected. Okay. And newborn babies, we don't often see it until uh, about a month out where they're having a problem because when we're born we have physiologic flexion, really, and so we're like this anyway, so it looks like it's okay, but then over a month gravity has opened us up and we have, we're more extension creatures, and so now we're looking for a balance, and then we can go like this, and then we can go like this and like that. So it'll look like it's okay initially because of physiologic flexion, but as soon as that goes away at four to five months, then four to five weeks, then you'll see a little bit more problems. So anyway, here's the baby. And we're on our belly, and we're really all the babies should be able to do at newborn. If you put them face down, they should be able to clear their airway. And I recommend if if you really are working with babies with pleasure assembly, is really do talk about tummy time. This is not out of the scope of being a physical therapist or a chiropractor or a nurse or anything. It's just it's a normal developmental activity. The American Academy of Pediatrics is asking us to do it. The doctors should be asking. This is all expect stuff. It's just like if you're saying, are you sleeping under? Your baby's sleeping on your back. Okay. And I don't ask that a lot because I don't really agree with it that much. But I do say, is your baby getting on their tummy? And if they say, oh, they hate it, say, would it be okay if we worked out a little bit? Because I just happened to you know, have this feeling that if we did this, this would really help the work we're doing here. This would really facilitate these, these, these tissues to become more balanced, to not hold on to so much tension and stress. So when we say babies should be able to clear their airway, when we put them down, we need to give babies, um, you know, their brains being immature, at, you know, they need 15 seconds to two minutes to respond to somebody. Now, I, I'm not that 
gung-ho about leaving babies for like a minute face down, except if you notice that our nose holes happen to be like down this way, and even if we were face down, we could breathe a little bit, and we have two loving or maybe three loving, caring human adults watching you, and you're okay, and we're not going to have a sense of it like right here. But babies need to be able to, just like they need to be able to do this thing with their head, they need to be able to lift it and turn it. Otherwise, they're going to be able to develop plagiocephaly. Like, okay? Because you need that act of turning to both sides to be able to pull it out. Because part of what you're talking about when it pops out is uh, we're working on using Wolf's Law, which is a bone will grow based on how muscle and tendons are pulling on it. Okay? So if you get a baby that never gets a chance to really work on you know, listen to turning that head, we're not going to get the pull on the bones. So when you get a baby who's playing just separately in three or four months and it's really, really flat and like a hate coming out and you get in there and they can lift their head, but we really need to work on them lifting their head a whole lot. And then guess what? This is where the big thing is. Pressing down the hands and upper extremities into the surface. That's the number one important thing. The entire forearm needs to be on the floor. The elbow needs to be connected to the surface. We don't want this. If you get that, you're going you're gonna to see this on the plagiocephaly side, the elbows are going to tilt up. And, and a lot of times that's missed. We need that, the hands to be in a symmetric position. We need the entire length of the forearm. I'm not going to go into why. I'm just going to tell you right now. And the elbow needs to be down. It's just the way it is. Okay? And that's the only way that there's a link tension relationship with all of these muscles that attach to the skull and that work the shoulder girdle to be able to start pulling. Okay, and then they lift up, and that's what pulls the head up. The muscles and everything is like pitching a tent. Who talked about that this morning? It's the same thing. Here's the tent. Here's the tent of the head. We've got muscles here and here and here. Everybody has to pull evenly for this head to grow because our, our baby's heads are usually a little bit more rounder than ours, and then over time they become more elongated. Like our heads, if you look around, are more elongated. There's longer anterior posterior dimension than, than, a, than a width. Yes. So if that's not happening, what you're saying, the contact with the arms, mm -hmm. would you facilitate that? Yes. So you would go along doing your cranial work and then you keep them over and over again and let them have the opportunity to get try. Yes. All the time. Yes. Yes. So it's a matter, it's not It's not enough to do cranial cycle therapy with kids with pleasure cephaly. I'm going to say that right now. You have to pair it with tummy time. <clears throat> you have to. Because um, we can come in here and do, and do all these releases, but if they go back to where they were and all the pressure and the movement, they don't ever get anywhere else. It is just simply not going to be enough. Okay, what we're doing is critical. And it's imperative. It's absolutely needed. It, it, tummy time is absolutely where we give everything to stick and stay and to actually move forward. And then they don't need us. This is why I usually say four to six sessions. And the one study that has been published showing that an osteopathic treatment for kids who have non synostatic Plagiocephaly benefited and they had a statistically significant change in their cranial base measurements with four sessions. Say four to six sessions, what you tell parents, yes? How long are your sessions when you treat the body of this Yeah. So my sessions, I play them for an hour. And, um, you know, I'm not doing the work that whole time, it's about or getting them in. And, and I have, um, I've just moved offices last week, so I'm going to talk about my whole office. <coughs> I'm moving in with a naturopathic doctor, it's going to be great, but I'm still, I'm not in my own place now, I'm going to be sharing, it's okay. I had a big waiting room, my own bathroom, and this huge 300 square foot treatment area, and, I, and it was a big deal to work on the parents separating themselves, leaving the car seat out here in the waiting room, and then you and I and the baby without our shoes go into my treatment space. And then so we would stay sometimes with somebody, because I'm in the waiting room for 10 minutes trying to get them away from the car seat. Yeah. And that helps teach them to get rid of the car seat. And then uh, after a couple of sessions, if I, I, I connect with people really, I'm, I'm a friendly person, okay? I'll say, hey, you know what? When you bring them in next time, don't even bring the seat in. See if, see if you guys can do that. Like, challenge, okay? <laughs> I'm just, don't even bring it in. You know, it's like, my, literally, my office like out in the parking lot is this, this tree right here. You do not need the car. And it's so simple the way they have it that it just picks up and you know, comes in. It is a little bit harder, but it's the challenge of getting them used to doing something different with their babies, and that can be sometimes just enough. And um, I work the whole body. Yeah. And I'm really focused on, um, um, I love how you were talking, you had that how about all that, that figures out. It's always that way with babies. You're always going to be able to see the plagiocephaly in the leg on the opposite side. You're always going to be able to see the, the hip. You'll be able to see the obliquity. You'll be able to see the torsion. You're going to see all that. We're going to get into treatment in just like two minutes, and we're going to talk a lot about that. But I do 
heavy hitting, start with the reciprocal tension membrane, right? And that's my main focus initially, yes? So with the tummy time, it's all supervised? And what, what do you recommend in terms of how much time a day should be? Yeah. So the American Academy of Pediatrics recommends a minimum of 30 minutes a day in a 24 hour period. That can be broken up in the periods throughout the day. It can all be done in the morning. You can do more than 30 minutes if you want. That's the recommendation. I stick with that. From my observer. Pardon me? From birth? Oh. Yes, from newborn. And that's what it says in, the, in, in their statement. Okay? As soon as you come home from the hospital. Tummy time can be anything, really, from laying on, you know, this tummy, on your lap, on your leg. You can get all kinds. You can do this. It's great. For some kids with reflux, this just counts as tummy time. You can tell parents you can walk around like this at home. You know, I know, and babies love this. This is universally known as a common condition. Okay? And they, and, they, and they love this. Now, the younger they are, you might you probably have to support their head. He's going to be dropping down. But you just, just like that. This looks like tummy time. But what we're working towards, no matter what, is the baby being on the blanket on the floor. Okay? Because that's the ultimate thing. That we're, that's our goal. By the time they're, you know, four to five to six months, their majority of their time is spent, unless they're being held, on their tummy on the floor, on a blanket, and they're doing it themselves. So our goal is always to trans, you know, say, okay, that's great, we've worked that for a couple of times, they're doing good with this, and they're doing good with that, and now we're going to try it on the blanket on the floor. I these tummy time classes. So um, there are actually classes where, you know, moms bring the kids in, and, and, and I do it on both sides of town now, and um, we, we come and practice tummy time, and that's what we do, because it's not always easy, okay? and especially if you don't start it early on. If you, if you go home and you encourage parents to start it right away, you have a lot less problems than later, because if you spring it on at eight weeks, and guess what, now we're going to on your tummy, or 12, you're going to have some problems, and there's a lot to it, yes. I'm not quite sure why I was thinking. Okay. Um, no, but tell me, so classes, I mean, is it kind of just the same thing in different languages you make? Do you feel like you have a series? Do you feel like you have a lot of different information? Or is it constantly new people shuffling in, and when they absorb enough, then they kind of move on? Um, one class I do a series of four, and it's usually the same people. And the other one's the class series of eight to nine, and they're usually the same people. Although people will trickle in and out. And we start them early, and usually um, there's, the moms are still on the first day. And so that's a really good thing. Um, and yeah, I talk about something different every week. And there's a secret to tummy time. We'll go ahead and tell you. Well, there's a lot of secrets, but I'll, I'll give you the main one. I've trademarked this, by the way. <laughs> it's fun. So um, this this onesie says, if I'm awake, roll me over. Uh, uh, and it says tummy time on the back. <laughs> and if you want one or two or three or ten of these to give to people, um, I'm, I'll make a list at the back, and when I get my next order, I will send you some. It says, if I'm awake, roll me over. Because it's just a nice reminder to um, do that. But it also kind of gives the secret away, because the rolling is the key. So I raise my issue, stand up or whatever. So this is what I'm going to show you. This is how you can come down. So I tell the parents, get into a comfortable position. This is comfortable for me. Okay. So what happens is we, we, first of all, we're holding our babies, right? Because that's basically what we do, and that's a wonderful thing. And what I, we call it plugging them in. So we take their heart and your heart and we plug them in. Okay, so we're plugged in. Okay, so we're nice and plugged in, and here we are. And then we're going to whisper to the baby, sweet nothing, is what I say. Now we know the baby's up to upright right now. We know the vestibular apparatus is starting to understand gravity. Okay, even just you know, 12, 24 hours after birth, they're starting to understand gravity. And they need to, right, to do the whole nursing thing, especially. So we're not going to just go... <laughs> <laughs> because if someone did that to me, I would hurl. Mm. And I do, regularly. You know, it's like, woo! <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's like really fun to place in the United <laughs> But we talk about how we help the baby process that. So every baby's in a little different place with how they're processing vestibular changes. So for some babies um, that the mom knows, we go down like this, where the mom, you have the same contact with the body, you go really, really slow and transition them down to the floor. I always talk to you know, conscious diapering classes, too, where we talk about this, where we're actually not really just changing the baby's diaper, but we're in a relationship with them, and we're looking at it the whole way, and we do that, too. Because you'll notice that diaper change is one of those times when babies just, like, lose it. And what can happen is if they lose it in this repeated experience, it's trauma, and it's getting stress hormones fluctuating. We don't really need that. We don't really need that insult to their sensory integration system. I'm an occupational therapist and a sensory integration expert, and trust me, you just don't want that. 
We have too many senses that need to be working efficiently for us so that we can do all these normal things. So we somehow we've gotten them to the point where they're down here and they're all happy. So we'll start with just like body brushes. We're just getting the front of the body ready, okay, for some for some weight and for some input. So we'll do maybe some body brushes and we'll say, and then what we do is like okay, we're gonna wrap it around the hips and around the thighs. Babies are responsible for everything above the belly button. This will help your nursing babies. They're gonna be responsible for everything above the belly button. And we begin to roll the baby, which is the secret, in the tummy time. We roll slow so the baby can process again. They're not the most mature people. They, they do need extra time to process this. So we roll really, 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 really slow all the way over to their tummy. We don't do anything with their arms at all unless it looks like the baby's asking for our help. Okay? So sometimes that means that the first baby trapped. It might not, because a lot of babies will they'll, they'll, they'll adjust and they'll pull it out because that's what they're, they're geared for doing that. But and here's the arm, and then and they're just wiggling around. And we want to give them how long do we want to give them to, to move? Two minutes. Up to. Okay? It usually doesn't ever take that long. If you're if, if it really takes that long for a baby. You probably helped it before that time. They probably have some neurologic problems, okay? Because that's like the end of it. We at least 15 seconds, right? So here we got that. And 15 seconds is a long time for a new mother. I'm <laughs> <laughs> struggling with something. And we're like, it's okay. It's okay. Look at this. You know, and you're okay. pointing out the positive things. And so we've rolled them because what What do you think we've enacted as we've rolled the baby? What are we enacting? Side body. Okay, the side bodies with appropriate receptors and let us know. We're, in, we're, we're beginning to start to tease the head and neck writing reactions, right? Because we're, our, the head is automatically going to want to adjust against gravity. Now, even they may not show that initially, but boy, they will after a couple of weeks of doing that. But also the vestibular activity. This is a rotary movement. There's two different ways that the vestibular process registers. One is in a linear movement, this way, this way. The other one's rotary. So we're addressing the rotary component. So we're grasping by the hips, or later on when they get really good at the thighs, we're rolling them so they're getting the sensation of how they're getting into the position and out. They're getting the appropriate reception, rolling along the side of their body, and they're getting the appropriate vestibular input, and here they are. Now, if their head is face down, we give them a couple seconds, how many, 15 at least, to move their head. Um, and a lot of times, you know, because I, I'm, sometimes I'm dealing with moms who are just a little bit anxious. Can you go ahead and help her neck for his neck? Deal. Just think of them. How do I do that? It's like, you squeeze that thing out of your vagina. It will yeah. be fine to pick it up and do it and stop. It's made to go through your vagina. And you have to pick it up and turn it to one side. So I say, make two big spatulas out of your, out of, here they are, okay? You make two big spatulas out of your hand and you gently and slowly and slowly and slowly and slowly, slowly turn the baby's head to one side. Doesn't matter which side. Although I do like the baby to go to their preferred side first. Okay? And so sometimes I like to notice on their back, which side do they like the head preference? And it's about 80 to 85, almost 90% to the right. And I think maybe what Allison said is, is way more important than what I said. But then, you know, sometimes it's to the left. So when you get them in prone, which is another word tummy time, you have to pay attention. It's like, oh, huh, interesting. They like their head to the right on their back, and they like their head to the right on their belly. That's one type of kid. The kid who likes their head to the right and supine, which is lying on their back, and then they get the prone, they like it to the other side. That's a different kind of kid. That's a different strain pattern. It's a different connective tissue problem all together. So here we are, and we're on our tummy, and um, we just really watch what happens with the baby. And really just a lot of wiggling and squirming and moving and, and the legs. And then we just lay in here. And then through the class, um, We'll do massage techniques. I do, um, you know, finding that sacral dimple. We do some sacral work. And put your fingers here. Just get really hot and melt. Um, um, to all these different things that, that I'll teach the parents to do. So then what happens is the baby starts to get upset. And I talk about two different types of cries. There's a talking cry and a frustrated cry. And this is breaking down a lot of information into two very, very generic, very, very basic buckets, okay? But this is how moms can relate. The talking cry is the one that kind of stays in the same octave. It doesn't ever do anything other than that. So it means we have to listen to it for a few seconds, okay? And so we're just tuning in, and this is where I start to teach parents about just listening to the baby. And now, this is always supervised. So the mother, I would say sometimes, too, get your breasts really close, squirt some breast milk on the thing, and get, you know, get your scent there, get really, really close, whatever, so that they can smell you. Get down so they can, you know, look into your face because they really like to look at your face.
face. We're doing all different kinds of things. As soon as it starts to escalate, the baby gets a little bit louder, their muscles are they're moving a little bit more. That's what we call a frustrated cry. This talking cry, it might be because they need to move their arms. So I'll say, well, look around. Just look and see what does it look like. Well, this arm was trapped. And they're going, bleh, bleh, bleh. well, let's just move that arm out and see if that helps. And just see, you know, see what happens here. And meanwhile, you know, you know that what the baby's doing is helping the work you just did. Okay? You just, you just worked all these membranes and they're sliding and gliding on top of each other. Now we've got some compression happening on the front of the body. And we've got this nice kind of like active thing going on. So the baby's supporting the work that you've done. Say the baby gets frustrated, then they're ready to roll out. And let's say we've only been here 45 seconds. My God, oh, you have 30 minutes and we only have 45 seconds. It's not a problem. Okay, you have a lot of time. So you take one arm and you tuck it under. And I usually tell the parents, turn the, the hand towards the body. So you tuck that little arm in and then you roll the baby out of tummy time. So the no-nos are picking the baby up and just plumping them down for tummy time. That's horrible and it's very disruptive and it's traumatic and it's not good. And then to two, to just pick them up. Now that's a lot less worse, okay, than, than just plunking them in. But that's because what does this position inherently do to the brain? Quiet. <laughs> it keeps them quiet. I like that answer. Um, it does. It calms all the nerves down. Because so, a baby cannot startle when they're contained like this. The startle reflex, part of the reason back to sleep can't work because they like start to drop down and stay before sleep. And then all of a sudden, mm -hmm. and so they, they stay in this really like superficial sleeping mode on their back. Right. Because as soon as something that happens, they're... But on your tummy, there's no way to do that. And it's so proprioceptively containing. So much like the womb. The position is different, but it's so much like the womb that the brain is just like, this is okay. This is all right. Okay. Now, the baby may be squawking because there's, there, there's the problems or maybe this whole, you know, they've had this shift and they're having these vestibular changes, but it will change and it changes so, so, so good. So here we are, we pull the baby out, and then we, put, we plug the baby back in. So we pick the baby up and we do heart to heart. And this is where the murmuring can start and you know all the things that you really want to do. You can drop down and you can go right to feeding, whatever you feel like doing. And then it's time to do tummy time again when the baby has taken a deep sigh or a deep breath. You do not put the baby back down and do tummy time again until they have reached level of homeostasis. Because we've, we've, we've and recruited all of this stuff, and then we need to go down. So what this does is it ends up, it ends up teaching the child not only about the relationship we're going to have for the rest of our life, how I'm going to help you get through developmental challenges or soft tissue restrictions or cranial molding, but then I'm going to do it respectfully, and we're going to use affective responses, and it also teaches the child through consistency and repetition to do the same thing every time, and the brain loves that. Loves it. Because they learn just like that. And you'll notice the baby, like, bleh, bleh, and, you go, and you start tucking that arm, and they start calming down. Because they realize they're going out. <laughs> and you see it so many times, they just learn. They're so fast, so quick. You pick them up and plug them back in, do the sweet murmuring, you drop down the nurse, they take a new side, you lay them back down, and then you do that for however long you want to do it for. Okay? And maybe it's 30 minutes, maybe it's 10, you're going to do a couple more sessions in another time. Questions about tummy time? Yes? How often do you see babies not liking tummy time because they've got restrictions through the neck, upper cervical area, versus um, they weren't laid down properly? Great question. Um, usually, it's they, they start fussing when they get in the tummy time position. If, if they lay down and they look wide-eyed, this is where reading subtle behavioral cues and affective responses, which is the vagus nerve, will give you more information than anything else. So if you, if you, you know, like, so you're saying that maybe they lay them down too quickly and then they turn them over too quickly and then they're upset. Or just put them straight down on their tummy. Yeah, that's horrible. Um, that's that's so hard for me. There are resilient human beings that don't. Okay, want what are you teaching them? I mean, I've never heard half the stuff you're talking about. <laughs> and I have a three-year-old. Right. Yeah. I'm amazing. I think between Alice and I, we've seen probably twenty thousand babies. I'm not kidding. His name is Carol. Like, oh, there's so much. Just like a 
repetition and repetition like thousands of times and see the same thing over and over. So that's a great question. What we'll do is if the baby's extremely fussy, then I'll start breaking it down and then we call in the machine analysis to find out like, what's really, really going on. So show me. You know? And then I'll say, oh, wait, did you notice that when you laid it down, the eyes got really wide and the pupils dilated at this point? They just got really white over here. You know, sometimes I won't point out color because of the parents. <laughs> I've learned from what I say to parents, and I've messed up. I mean, it's, it's, I've learned from all the stupid things I've said, the stupid things I've done. So it's really, really good. But um, parents don't, I don't know why, but they don't like you talking about the color of their baby. I don't know, it's like, even if it's just turning wider or whatever, but, you know, a real modeling. Sometimes babies will get modeled really, really quickly. Or modeling doesn't really, it's not, modeling is not a great experience of, like, immediate physiologic dysregulation. It's, like, chronic. Okay? So those are the, those are the kids. But the eyes widening and the pupils dilating, that's big. I'm like, you know, I, I have a feeling. I'm always real tentative. You know, I do know everything, but I'm telling you I don't. So I'll look like <laughs> just that sometimes, and I wonder, I just wonder if maybe it's the lay down. Let's try it next time. After we get the big to the side, let's try it this time. Let's try it a different way. So are you able to do this? And you all find that. If not, then we'll find a way for you know, um, they talk about anchoring at the shoulders. That's proprioceptive input, guys. That's telling the brain to calm down. The two, what we call key points of control, hips and the shoulders. If you press here and you press here, the brain's going to go, oh, goodie. Thank you. I love you. Okay. It's going to cut down on the startling. Even if they're like that, which is like, why doesn't the surface do that? Well, it just doesn't because it's a hard surface and we're pressing in certain places, okay? and not pressing in other places. So it's this proprioceptive, but hey, so when you put them down, or if the baby, I've worked with a lot of babies who have it a lot, let's swaddle them gently with your little cloth diaper or whatever you brought with you, squeezing the shoulders, and as we lay them down, we're doing a little bit of squeezing at the shoulders and squeezing at the hips as we lay them down. Oh, now look, now you've got a little bit of a smile. Let the eyes stay in your normal appearance, you know, like that type of thing. Don't look like you're like, what's going on here? What's happening to me? So I'll tease it out. That's the answer. Yes. What about babies who are older that start getting upset, you know, when they go to change them or something and they're past, you know, the infant stage? So, um, like how old? Like a year. So they're a year old and, you, and you, when you go to put them down, they do that? Yeah, but my sensitivity. sensitivity. So you can do things like um, do some vestibular challenges like swinging. Mm -hmm. Right? Um, you can, um, one of the things I like to do is just, is just to work the system, because we know there's an inherent so what is this, the vestibular apparatus, we're checking temporal bones, we're checking, you know, we're checking bone more with sphenoid, because all of that has implications for that, we're checking all the midline structures, we've done this really great treatment. We're going to do the cranial work, because that's really what's helping the tissue get healthy and slide and glide against each other and give them everything. And guess what we're doing? We're really creating space. Okay? So that's what we're really doing, is creating space for them to be able to move. And, the, and, the, and these compressed areas really are sticky, and, the, and, and it, doesn't, it doesn't feel like it slides and glides like, it, like normal. Okay? And you just, it's just with practice, that palpation will come to you. you. Just be open to it. You know, Make your hands little tiny little receptors and say, I'm open to feeling this. I'm open to, I really want to feel it all, even though I haven't had something that was good. See, I want to feel it right now, and you set that intention. But I would say that a child has a vestibular, mm -hmm. and I would work it. So I would think of all different types. So it would be like you were playing games like lift them up and lower them down, and lift them up and lower them. Watch the responses, and wherever I see the biggest affective change, I know that's the sticky spot. So let's say we were bringing them up, and they start freaking out right here. Well, I know it's this 45 degree angle. So I'll do all kinds of things with a 45 degree angle. And I'll also make sure that the pelvic is Pelvis are balanced because the, a lot of the pelvis are going to the pelvis too. Their experience, you don't notice, there will be a ton of it who's just sitting at one, and they're on one issue of fibrosity. Like the other one's not even getting any weight. And when you go in, I tell the parents, like, massage this other, you know, this little butt thing up here. You know, and they're like, Wah! Wah! they do not want their issue of fibrosity touched. Very sensitive area. Okay, we, we understood, we heard all that from this morning, how that could possibly, and many of us have these things because we did when we were infants. Mm -hmm. okay, many of us have 
bowel and intestinal inflammation problems from our problems from the foundation that we've set our whole body up in the first year of life, and really the first six months, and really the first three months. So I would work that. So I, I'm wondering if you um, have a suggestion for how, well, first of all, when do you recommend starting this? Um, because obviously I'm working with breastfeeding problems and I've got a mother and a dad who aren't sleeping and they're <coughs> intensely working, trying to work through the breastfeeding relationship. And it, I can see that one of the last things they're going to want to do is, oh, now i got to do tummy time too? Yeah, that's a great question. And, I, and, and, and I've you know, been teaching tummy time for five years now. And I've always found it to be helpful. Because number one, it gets their mind off breastfeeding. Gives them something else to focus on. It gives especially dad. Dad doesn't become the tummy time viewers. Right? <laughs> it gives them something to do and they can focus on. It. And it's so clear and it's so consistent and so concise. And you can tell them why what they're doing is going to help breastfeeding. Why what they're going to do is going to help their sensory. Why what you're going to do is going to make them most resilient to be able to get on. You know, and, and, and have all their their natural instincts come about. So when they realize the importance of how that overlays, then they're like, huh. You say, this is just as important as coming here to see me. Mm -hmm. So it really is about having enthusiasm and, uh, and really directing their focus in, in, in the right way yep. to emphasize it. So you would, like I'm seeing a lot of babies that are four and five days old, just as appropriate to do the tummy time at that point. Yep. Yep. Newborn. And the things you're looking for are you're giving them any sex, like once you get them on their tummy, you're looking for them to roll over, do it themselves if yeah. possible, mm -hmm. and if they can't help them, then also you will have their arms in comfortable position, and then like that, on the thing. And then are, they, are you also waiting for them to roll their face to the other side? Well, then, I mean, it depends on their age. I mean, now we're getting into developmental skills. Uh, so it depends on their age. I mean, you know, a um, a baby who's had several days on the planet and has been in tummy time will lift and turn their head um, within, I don't know, I mean, a lot of, I, I would hate to say it, but a lot of babies can do it first day. I mean, and, and we're really capable of it. If we have, you know, the right environment and the right time, the baby can do it right away. But, you know, usually I was in the first week, you know, it's a, it's a period of adjustment and we're learning new things and maybe they're not doing tummy time a whole lot. But, yeah, they look and look and turn their head side to side. And Although, you can turn it to the other side. So say they're here, and you know that they only turn their head to the right side, and they've got the flattening already starting up. You're not going to see a lot of flattening early on unless it was, um, even if they have, the reason for plagiocephaly is the birth trauma, you won't often see the flattening yet. Because the bones haven't had a chance to flatten. You're just, it's the strain pattern that's in the tissues. And so, are you, as you're, so the good thing is if you do have a kid with pledges something, you can get in there and feel that and then compare it with another baby that you're seeing. Because then you'll start to, oh, uh, that's what it feels like before it starts to get flat. This is what the tissue feels like. This is what the, you know, the tenacity of the tissue is. Because what we know about portopolis is a lot of times when we look at it under the microscope, it looks like what is like compartment syndrome, where there's scar tissue built up in the muscle, and so PTs, and we think very PT-ish sometimes that it's the muscle, when it's actually the, the connective tissue that's, that's having a problem. The connective tissue that's building up bulk and scar tissue. Now, body and its infinite wisdom needed to for some reason, but then the remolding will happen. But if they don't get that turning and they're always at that side, the remolding's not going to happen. It's going to set them up for having a chronically thicker, contracted cervical mastoid, which is going to pull. And guess what? Babies don't really have a mastoid process. This is going to be part of our palpatory thing. But this is going to be a place that we palpate with pledges of You always want to palpate the mastoid area. Okay? Do not let a baby leave your office and you have not palpated the mastoid <laughs> area efficiently. I would be in your brain responding with <laughs> the mastoid process develops over the first year as the sternocleidomastoid pulls on it. That's that wolf ball again. The bone will grow based on how it's pulled. So if you get a kid who already has plagiocephaly, there are, you know, and, 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 and that mastoid process is in development in the year. You should be able to feel, you may feel one side more protruded already than the other. That mastoid area needs to be eventually filled with air cells for proper hearing and conduction. 
There are a lot of babies. I look at a lot of x-rays, a lot of MRIs, and a lot of CT scans. I do a lot of stuff with radiology. And routinely, I will say, mastoid cells filled with fluid, not air. It's a problem. Okay? So, the mastoids. That, so, here's the baby, and it's like, man, they only turn their head to the right in the world. They only turn their head to the right, and here they are. It's like, well, that's really fantastic. But I also know the baby needs to get to the other side. So you make your spatula hands, you slide, this is another trick, you slide underneath the skull side to the cheek. You've got your fingers pointing out like they're seeing this way. And then you slowly, I'm just going to support my baby like this because her neck doesn't turn that easily. And I'm going to begin to slowly turn the baby's head. Normal range of motion is all the way chin to shoulder, 90 degrees or more, it can be 110. Now it's maybe the restricted side, they may have some real problems. You want to stop turning the head as soon as you feel that first soft end feel. You do not want to just go because then you're gonna what if you're holding a bucket of water and I have more water? Is that gonna make you relax or tense up more? Yes. So we got a bucket of water here, we're being very comfortable. But here we go. Let's say that that first end feel was here and they're not quite chin to shoulder. It's okay. Because we're going to get gravity and time in the way of the baby's head and whatever work we've done to eventually open that up. So say the baby's like just, you know, kind of like right now. So, you know, you really want the ear on the floor. That's the other thing. You really want that ear to really touch the floor. Because that's what's going to help us. You know, we've done all our work. And maybe you'll do a little bit of work even after they've done a little bit of time. Maybe you just roll them over and you say, hey, I'd like to work the back and the neck and the turn more. You may not even say time again. You're just doing it and give it you know. And here you are, and you're doing the back. And this is a great time to work back here because you can really palpate the squamous portion of the occiput, which, you know, it's, that, it's the shelf, it's the, it's the flatter side. Now, it is one piece because the sutural lines are like the condylar edges and then the basal part that connects to the sphenoid. Guess what? Our throat hangs from this, the occiput at the front. The, the pharyngeal raphae, the tubercle, from our throat come up and insert on our occiput. Did you know that? Mm-hmm. And you know that one of our tongue muscles attached to the scapula, the homohyoid? Yeah. Okay, so this is how this is all affected. So when you think about physiologic flexion, and now I'm in tummy time, I'm automatically opening my chest, I'm pulling my scapulas down, I'm getting clavicular rotation. Um, I, this morning I had a big aha, and it was um, Heather's talk where you were saying about something, I can't remember. Oh, that the SI joints were, you know, load the upper, you know, load the upper body into that. Well, it's, um, it's an absolutely, it's a beautiful correlation because when we're turning here and um, we've got this weight-bearing thing happening, it's translating all these forces from the head to the shoulder girl. It's the same exact thing. Mm-hmm. All right? So that's what helps to unlock those areas. Right? And you're doing your work here, and you've got the pressure that's helping you. Okay. So the mastoid process is here, and then we get the, head, the baby's head, and then eventually we want that ear there. It's a big aha I had when I went to we'll come back. I'm mm-hmm. saying the SI joints are that, the primary lingering surface. That's annoying, it happens to me sometimes, though. Okay, so here we are, and, and then we're going to roll the baby out. Now, you know, there's no, like, real way, like, instead of looking this side, you always roll the other. It doesn't matter, really, because you can just tuck the arm and you roll the baby right over their face. It's not a problem. And actually, that's a really helpful thing. The facial bones, because they need mobilized, too. And if you do a, if you do a trait with a plagiocephaly and you don't work the zygomas, we're having trouble here, too. We need to get on the zygoma. It's absolutely, it absolutely imperative that we, we treat the zygoma the, itself. Like you're just on the zygoma, and you're, you're following it, you're, you're working with the tissue, you get a ton of releases. Because this is the, not only the, the floor of the eye, and like we have six extra ocular eye muscles, and all but one of them attached to the sphenoid. And the sphenoid always wanders in plagiocephaly, unless it's brachiocephaly and everything's shoved forward. And even then, you've got so much tension in the frontal bone, because you can pull to foreheads, you know. I mean, it's just absolutely incredible. The pressure that can go, whoop, pulling it this way, stretches it out that way, and pulling it this way, stretches it out that way. That's why we're getting the, the cheek on the floor and the ear on the floor. We've got to get those, um, those um, cheekbones. So if you've got a kid that already has plagiocephaly and you absolutely know it, you can use vision to get some stretches in. Because 
all but ones insert on the sphenoids. So you can get a baby and you're like, oh, hey. And you get in the fall with your eyes and you're like, you know they need to look to the left. They're getting their eyes, eyes, eyes. And as their eyes, 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 their, their eye muscles are pulling on their sphenoid. So it begins to pull and just dissociate and work on those connected tissue. Okay. So you get that, you get everything to work with you. Is yes. that a help or a hindrance with like nystagmus? Would that be a good thing to do that type of exercise? Or if they have nystagmus, the yeah. it can help a lot. Because um, nystagmus, I mean, there, it's very few babies that actually have nystagmus. I have one in my practice right now, so no. Yeah. Um, it's a very good thing, but sometimes you'll need to adjust the depth with which you're doing it. It's like it's like a six to twelve inches kind of thing. Because sometimes with the stagus is because the object is too big. <coughs> but it, um, you know, there's like some things of whether the stagus is actually central or whether it's like a motor control thing, and it can be really, you know, it's a big, big thing. So I want to make sure we go through treatment stuff before um, before my time is down. But the visual inspection. So you so here's the baby. You're looking at eight centimeters. They come in and you're like, oh, what if you guys don't lose a second of your time with them. Don't comment on too much. So you're, you're saying all the things, but you're really looking at them, right? Yeah. You're looking at the face, the eyes, the nose, the chin, the cheek, the ears, the head. What, do you see any bossing anywhere? Do you, what do you notice when, when, they, when they bring it in, in the car seat? Which side are they looking to? What do they look like in the car seat? What do they look like when they're getting out of the car seat? When they pick the baby up, what happens? Where, you know, so you, all of this stuff is helping you begin to formulate your, your opinions about what's happening. Because even, I mean, I really, and even in these summertime classes, how many of the five years that I've been teaching these classes, maybe 10 kids have really had a diagnosis of plagiarism and gone and done anything about it? Because this is whether you get the diagnosis or not. Because it's not really anything. Plagiarism is not really anything. Okay, it's just cranial only. So there's a lot of undiagnosed cases. And I would say that probably in my, my tummy time classes, and I'm not talking about kids I see either to PT. In my time in my classes, for typically developing parents, I mean, the, the typically, mostly typically developing babies, but mostly typically developing parents, um, you know, there's probably, um, I mean, Viola Fry has done some of this work, 87% of all babies have a walking asymmetry of some sort. 87 means over three quarters of all babies need our treatments for plenty of We may not call it that because we don't need to diagnose for that, but we definitely know that it's way, way, way more prevalent than it's getting diagnosed. So I see about 87.5% of babies in my second time classes have some sort of cranial molding. So everybody's going to benefit from all of these treatments, which is good. So we're looking at the orbits. We're looking at facial expressions, especially during crying or yawning. Um, obvious overrides, lumps, bumps, different things. Those are definitely things we're looking at. Those, those seem, you know, most of us can see those really, really carefully. Don't assume that the lump bump override really needs treatment. They were still following body and listening. And usually this is just an extrapolation and it's not the problem. And unless there's like an isolated little coronal suture stenosis or like a sticky spot, and then that is very much the linchpin. You work on that stick, sticky spot. How do you do that? Well, you put your finger on either side of the suture, melt like butter. Maybe sometimes you'll feel some movement. Maybe you'll follow in micro, 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 micro milliliters. Maybe you'll go a little bit. I'll exaggerate so you can see it. Maybe you'll go a little bit like this, or maybe you'll go like that a little bit. Kind of toggling back and forth. Maybe you'll just heat it up. Maybe you'll use the palm of your hand. Maybe you'll do, I do sometimes like a little zigzag technique. So when I come in, and I, I want to show you my hands on palpation. Um, that's good. Skin tone and muscle tone, those are good because babies have played just like, it's just like your skin's duller. And their muscles, they just, I don't know, it just feels different. You know, it just looks different. Maybe they just don't have or, or you can't see their neck at all. Okay. Babies are born like this and they don't have a neck. And that's what the biggest thing about us in the first year of life is that we get neck in our nation. Right. Okay, so palpation. So basically, it depends on the baby, the age, and everything else, but how, how the hands on things go. And I, I always will do an assessment and I always start the pelvis because it's really the keystone in that area, even though we think it's all in the head. It, it really, we need to balance the pelvis first. So usually this doesn't even look like anything to the parent. I'm just contacting the baby, and, and here I am working with the pelvis, okay? And then, and then, and then I'll stick up and, and work the rest of the diaphragm, okay? And the ribs and the sternum. This is a big old. And the other thing with babies, with, with babies just in general, I'm seeing a lot more, like, in my awareness, the thymus glands right behind the sternum. That's a big thing in, in our immune system. It's most, most uh, workable in babies and in childhood because it's building our immune system. But there's a lot of incidents, I do a lot of, I told you, looking at radiology things, of a thing called a cervical thymus, 
Remember that? Mm-hmm. So the thymus gland is so large that it goes up into the cervical area. It's very common. Mm-hmm. And then we get bigger and grow, and our thymus is not, we don't think it's functional. But I would, I would, I would disagree with that as well, that we do, in fact, use our thymus gland somehow. We just don't understand <laughs> all of that. But so that's another issue too. So uh, then you're balancing that because if there is a restriction because there's a certain mm-hmm. cervical thymus, there's nothing everybody, any doctor would do about a cervical thymus because everybody kind of grows out of that. But you can just help resettle things because maybe it just needs to happen. Then I always go up to the cervical vigor joint, otherwise known as a thoracic and then release. But you think about that because the clavicles, oh, that was what it was. The SI joints are loading from the upper body. The clavicles, guess what? The only attachment our arm has or our axial skeleton. Is here at the cervical vicular joint. It's very quite a stable joint. It's a very tiny joint on a very thin bone, and the baby's is very much like this. Okay, so this is a crucial part in working with plagiocephaly. This is a treatment technique. Always do a really good thoracic inlet release. Do not think you're wasting your time being there. Do not skip over this. Spend more time than you think you need to, and palpate the classical all the way to the distal aspect. Okay? From here all the way up. Okay? So that's a really great one. But this, this cervicovicular area is where the whole entire scapula, the humerus, and the lower end of the upper extremity, and the clavicle. It's the only place that attaches to the axial skeleton. The axial skeleton being the skull and the spine. So it's, it's, a, it's a big area. It's a big deal. And it does. It. You will notice asymmetries. You'll notice differences. You'll notice all kinds of things. You clear some stuff up here, and it clears everything out to go up here. Okay? So um, I'm here, and then I'll go to the highway, obviously, because anytime you got neck, you got the highway, in, and the highway just about kind of just binding in a little bit, and just sitting on it, rotating. I, I do like to slide my fingers underneath, just because I think that I need to, you know. And so if you don't, and then you just go up, and then and then I'm all over the jaw, okay. And then I'm, I'm really just kind of going out of protocol for those of you who follow some of this. But you can also slide your hand at the back and you do a cranial base release. Really. Okay. And how do you do a cranial base release with a kid who has plagiarism assembly? Um, you just do it the way you do any other one. You're working on just getting the tissue to move where it's not moving. That's that's the secret. <laughs> okay. you, just, you just find the areas that aren't moving and you just sit on them and melt them until they are moving, right? Very dumb work. And then I start with the head. So I'll have my head, my the baby's head in my hand, and I'll feel that I'm doing the occiput and maybe somewhat um, the temporal just depends. And then on the priles, okay, you do like this, and then I do like the temporal. And I'll, I'll, I have two hands over, so like that. And then I'll start, and I'll, I'll palpate the anterior fontanelle. And I will go ahead and trace the line of the anterior fontanelle. Because of every baby's different, and this is an area where you'll notice a lot of stuff will happen if you're just palpating the anterior fontanelle. Many of us are afraid to touch it. You're not going to hurt it. I, I walked around with a neurologist for like two years watching him check the anterior fontanelle, and he would just die if you realize how far they stick your head in the computer. <laughs> yeah, it's like, I'd be like, really? Yeah. You know, the brain's way down in there. This is a very tough mother, you know, here, uh, figuring it out. So I palpate, you know, around the anterior front. Now, then I start, I do, this, I do the sutures. I go and I palpate along all the suture lines. And that's extremely valuable because that's what these babies who play this they need. They need you to do sutural restriction work. Okay? Because it is in the sutures at this point. If they have... Definite cranial molding, you need to pass the <coughs> which means you have to be very clear about the anatomy. And very, very clear. Because what we're trying to do is imagine that reciprocal tension in the brain. And we're no longer thinking in terms of occiput, parietal, temporal, you know, immobilizing these bones. We're conceptualizing this thing as the peace sign. It's a polyglot. So we're treating that. <laughs> we're treating the whole thing. We're not treating one area. We're holding this reciprocal tension memory. When I'm going like this, I'm getting a sense for how the whole thing is moving together. And so what you'll notice with kids with play this stuff later, I'm just going to show you one pattern. There's many. It feels like this. with this peace sign in it and, and how it's all moving around. 
right? And I'm treating the whole thing. I'm not just treating one little thing. Because that's the only way you're going to get plagiocephaly to really clear up because it's actually not just that area. It's the whole thing because the head is like a really thick water balloon. If you go and push on it, it's going to bulge out somewhere else. That's where you get the bossing. The bossing is important. Bossing just means that one starts bulge out. There's so much pressure and tension in the head that it's blown a tire, basically. Well, except we're resilient. It didn't blow. You know, it just it gave in the weakest area, <coughs> and that was an adaptable function. It's a good thing. It's not putting any pressure on the brain. And everything's really great, or whatever. But um, you're going to want to notice areas of, of, of really consistent bossing are the frontal bones, and then you'll feel sometimes. Two big bulges right here on the parietal bone. They'll feel really, really hard. You want to sit on that, just cup it and do what I call just a, a squeegee. So everybody put their hand up and start to get, so use your palm as like an extension. You're thinking of like coming in with your palm and then coming out with your palms. So you're treating with the palm of your hand. So you just a little bit, and I'm, I'm super exaggerating that. It. It's almost like, it's like if you have a dent in your car and like put that suction thing on, like, <laughs> Kind of <laughs> on the bossing. Now the worst place to work with bossing is the temporal bossing. You all know that right above the ear. And oh my God, you please, first of all, you want it almost to be symmetric. <laughs> and if not, if one side's bossing the other one, I says it's just the most, it's it's just the most hideous compression. It's so hard and it takes lots of sessions to clear it up. And if anybody that treats baby tells you, oh, I saw a baby one time and blah blah, blah it's happening, I say you're not. Really doing anything because miracles don't really happen with this work when we have these type of professions. When we have something set up with measures, it takes multiple sessions, it takes four to six sessions, and sometimes more, and we're peeling the layers of an onion back. We're retraining the tissue to be in their skin. We're, re we're restoring what we think, and it depends on if it was an intrauterine, and this is an old place, so it goes back from way up. They may never have had normalization of their tissues. Okay, so how are you going to show them what normalization is if they've never had it in the first place? We're, we're, just, we're bringing these kids towards that. So it's like all new experiences. So that's why it always looks a little bit different. Okay, so, and, but the temporal bossing is really, really hard um, to deal with. Lots of, um, you know, and the thing of it is, you, you do lots of ear pulls and front to back. I do this whole thing where I like imagine I have maggots in my hand. It's like, <laughs> okay, and that's what I'll do. Like, when I'm taking my hands off, off, off the bottom like that. <clears throat> okay? So I, I palpate all the sutures going along here. I'll notice which side that it, um, that it really is flat to and what, what it feels like. Is it going up into the temporal? You know, I'm looking at the ears. So because not only will one, will one ear be in front of the other, but one ear will slightly be higher. You'll know definitely the sphenoid is really having some trouble. So you always want that oxyphoid sphenoid relationship and always with the greater wing. You definitely, definitely, definitely will have you know, use your normal contacts here, and you will do just like a normal decompression. But just shh, you're trying to back that off. You're trying to how you need to follow this side bend if you want, or how, however that looks for you. However you can train to teach you to do that. Um, and then the zygoma and the maxillary. And my favorite. I mean, I love to stick, you know, love finger into a baby's mouth because you get a lot of stuff done. But you can do it just like this. It's just effective. It really is. It can be just, just as effective. Um, you're looking at, um, okay, the spine, the pelvis, and the extremities. I said quickly you can do the extremities, or you can skip the extremities if time is of essence. But if you have time, don't skip the extremities, because you're going to see it all extrapolated out with the biomechanical changes in the body, is it that structure, and you're going to see it, just like a telephone cord where you're letting the whole thing out. It's going to be effective along the whole thing, even if some part of it didn't look like a coil. Okay, so you, you get to the extremities if you can, but if you if you clear up this axial part in the trunk, you're going to get a lot of the extremities are going to happen. It's, it's going to come out. But I would never treat an extremity before I would go to centrally. You know, I wouldn't look and say, oh, that baby has a ton of extra rotation here at this leg, this arm, let's work here, and then do that unwinding. That's not normally what I would do, unless I really felt like that was, that was what I was called to do. Okay, objective measurements is, is, is boring to talk about. I'm going to completely skip over it. I'm tantalizing you with the words here. There's lots of ways to do it. And on that is what we use that sort of top of line. So you say, um, they've got a posterior asymmetry. Yes. Um, do they have a displental ear, position anterior or inferior? Uh, yes. So they're already in type 2. You see how that works? They have a frontal asymmetry. So temporal bossing type 5, that's the worst. You see temporal bossing, that's the worst case scenario. So it's just like,
like there's so many strain patterns in the head that it's just the most, um, it must be used. So this is just a way of, um, one way of classifying this you know, for objectively. Probably very few of our, I'm doing a research project right now and have a research protocol and um, a team of people, we're going to look at this and we're going to try to repeat what the study was that Sylvie Lester done and did in, in Canada, which showed that four sessions changed statistically significant the cranial base, transcranial diameter discrepancy in four sessions. Okay? But the thing of it is, guys, I say four to six just because I just like to have a question. And I just found that sometimes it takes six. Is, is that, um, you know, it's... It just is not a process that happens overnight. It, it really, it, it takes the process of us working with the technical team, getting years years of mobilization, and following that up with how many times, yes. How far between appointments do you feel like it's ideal? I try not more than a week. It's definitely, and this is where some of you who have, like, my practice is all babies. So, and, and um, you also know somebody's not really doing baby work, they tell you they have a waiting list for a year. I just hear that. <laughs> if you have a waiting list for more than two weeks, you're not working with babies. Okay? So don't ever tell them you have a waiting list for babies. It's embarrassing. <laughs> because you, we know you're not really treating babies. <laughs> because they need to get in, they need to get in quick, and they need to get in right now. So we, we try to, you know, for those who have run, run just primarily baby practices, like, you know, I don't have anything out of my books three weeks. And insane. I don't have to show up or what's going to go on. or Unless it's a repeater, I got my six treatments together or something like that. Okay? So, but I try not to have more than seven days. And sometimes if I have the luxury of doing it sooner, I will. Um, and, and I've also had I've also had to have more time. Um, and but if I do, because I travel a lot, if I do, I'll send them to someone else because they need the treatment more than they need to do it. Okay. So um, I want to really quickly, because we do have three and a half minutes, um, talk about um, the treatment. But a lot of this is stuff you already know. Tummy time, active head turning. Okay. <laughs> Uh, Sideline is so important. When we talked about anterior and posterior, well, we also have right and left. And so if we lay here, we're going to get elongation on the weight bearing side, and we're going to get elongation on the weight bearing side. So it's going to just clean up your work for you. Okay? Just making sure they get on the right and left side. Diaphragm releases, cranial base releases. You know, it just takes a little plunk of the cranial base. And really, I, I like to use this meaty part right here that I have with the arm and This is my little cranial base releaser right here. I just, it just, it's how I've done it. It's how I've learned my, to use my hands proprioceptively with other people. But to kind of get your, your how do you release the cranial base? And what does the cranial base release mean to you as far as releasing it to babies? Because it's not about getting up in there and like spreading the condyle necessarily, but it is about backing the tissues off a lot of time and creating space. Okay, you, you sense the area of stagnation and you work with it. Um, the, uh, the ear pull, which is always good, it teaches to everyone. Straight lateral for babies, which is the temporal portion, uh, the deepest portions of our, of our, they're not formed and they need to go straight out. And when adults, we take like a 45 degree angle from the rear. Uh, so I always teach that, and I always teach it as if, you know, you're just taking up the slack. You pick up the ears, you pull them here, and you're just going to pick up the slack. And then uh, the moms always say, I thought this one here pulling on me. I'm like, who's that? <laughs> I have moms do most of the work. I'm lazy. Um, uh, this this one is a good one. The temporal sandwich. This is a beautiful technique for the baby to put stuff in. The asymmetry is so. This is like the, uh, the axis of rotation, so to speak, for this because of how the temporal bones are. And I, you know, like a little math for the future. So the sandwich technique is really great. You're just really balancing the tissue side to side and feeling the motion of the temporal bones, knowing that they're in three pieces, knowing all the vestibular apparatus is there. And you're following, and you're, you're waiting to find the tissue release, and you're just balancing and harmonizing, and you're just here, right? And you're non doing therapeutic presence. You're breathing, you're doing your own breathing, because our breathing will help. Because like we talked about the pelvis and, 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 and the temporal bones and the iliad and all these things overlapping, what we'll find, I barely, I found this out, like, I had been doing this for a while, I was holding my breath, and because I was reflecting that pattern. So if you breathe really deep into your respiratory diaphragm, that will help them um, The drill tube rock and glide, that's a beautiful one. Of course, everybody knows that with babies. I don't need to tell you that. Um, the sticky suture smelting, that's what I call that. <laughs> and um, you know, you're just holding and palpating the sutures with your CST fingers. It's 
melting is my favorite word. Oh, directly into the sutural lines. Because you know, kind of like that's why our sutures are there is to take up the you know is, is to take up the pressure and the slack. You know, it's like with birth. That's why that's why we have you know, a lot of our sutures in our head that way, so the pressure too doesn't you know crank our brain down. But um, you just want to open up all those sutures. Get your anatomy textbooks out, and I think we're going to get a little bit of anatomy in the next couple of days. And just really look at all the suture lines, because there's a lot more fontanelles, too. The earlier the baby you were, there's fontanelles back here behind the ears and up here. You just really want to pay attention. There's not just two fontanelles on an old baby you get there. But now, babies who have IUGR will have huge anterior fontanelles. Lots of babies will have big anterior fontanelles. You'll see some babies that have like a freaking pinhole. That's troublesome. Because that it gets really, really sticky really, really quick. And that posterior felt no all the time would put yourself like really need help because you may not even be able to palpate it. And just the, the intention that you have to palpate it will be the release that the baby will have. Um, shoulder girdle work, we talked about the scapula, and its attachments to the sternum and the humerus and, and, the, and uh, the scapula. Scapular mobility. Um, I, I like to do this little technique where I just put two fingers on the scapula, and so we're just going to do cranial work right here on the scapula. And all the time, it, it, I don't care which side it is, it could be the infected side or the non-infected side, one of those, one scapula is popped up. Okay, so just like the pelvis can have these, when you soak in, the, soak in the scapula, so you really want to kind of normalize that a little bit. Knowing though, that if they're on their tummy and their head's turned to one side, one scapula is going to feel differently anyway because of the, the skull side and the head side. Just kind of pay attention to that. The turn the other side is going to be a little you want to start getting used to feeling what, what is abnormal, what's really popped up in the scapula. And a lot of times it's not the superior scapular muscles, it's the subscapular muscles and the serratus anterior, which is why we do respiratory diaphragm. The serratus anterior goes from scapular wrapped around all the way to all the ribs. All right. The highway, the tongue, the floor of the mouth. And you, you can really do a lot from the outside of the tongue. And the tongue is like a dog's tail. It's our biggest proprioceptor. Okay? And so babies, a lot of times, if they have trouble with their head turning, you see they'll stick their tongue out. So you can really help them with their head turning by using your little suck search, um, you know, stimulating their reflexes, which will help them be better at breastfeeding, right? Because you're going to do that. So you can do that. You can use a little bit of their tongue and, and with, you know, to get them to turn their head. Okay? The tongue is a great muscle, and babies are saying that they don't have head control. They absolutely, I love what Megan was saying about, they really do have responsibility for their head. And, and this is why we, we let the baby have everything above their belly button, rolling them over to tummy time. That's what will make sure that they have all of those things. And some babies don't, but it's because they have soft tissue restrictions, because they have trauma on board. I'm a minute over. Is anybody okay if I go one more minute? Yeah. Okay. Um, eyebrow pressure points. Super great because what's this bone right here that makes up the superior orbit of our eye? The frontal bone. And plus, just if you know anything about facial reflexology, there's a ton of pressure points along the eyebrow. So I'll start medial, you know, and I have this little, um, like a rocking thing. I, I like to rock my finger along. So and babies don't really like you to include their vision. So I come from the head and I just roll. I kind of roll my finger, move position. Roll my finger, move position. Roll. It's just a little bit of a roll. Well, this is all done with cranial touch. This is five grams or less. I love saying that. How do I know it's five grams or less? Go to Office Depot and get and buy yourself one of those little things that you, that you weigh stuff for mail, and and then you take it home with you and it's electronic, and you're like, okay, this is seven grams. Check myself. And you can do that. And I did that for years because I had a lot of electric stuff. So like, okay, this is thirteen grams. I would be right on. You will. We are sophisticated instruments. And we, one gram, so you'll be able to know how many grams you're getting, okay, because it's really important to be able to, to tune in, okay, with how many grams of pressure we're getting. Uh, the sternocleidomastoid palpation, this is the worst one, guys, I hate to tell you, but almost every baby, except the one I worked with the other day, will start to fuss a little bit with this, because it's just so, just basic to our survival, but I always like to start a mastoid process when we've already had some palpation happening. Follow that sternocleidomastoid all the way down. It has two different insertions, one to the sternum, one to the clavicle. Mm -hmm. So really important work. You probably clear a lot of it up by doing, you know, your, your prep work coming up the body and the cervicalicular and the palpate and the clavicle. But the sternocleidomastoid itself needs some cranial sacral therapy. Okay? Sometimes I'll just I'll just like the guitar and I'll just put my finger on it like that and I'm just going up and down, just moving and just working those tissues. 
balance the bone or the sphenoid. Just follow and allow the process to occur. You do not need to show it. Okay? You just need to be uh, the container, the therapeutic presence for that to happen. And a natural biological process will show up. And the whole time you're having complete faith and trust in this little baby's organism. Okay? That's just the way it happens. Um, you can also do a lot of parent education um, about anything I said or anything you think of that you, that applies to what you already know. You can pull a little bit of what I said and what you already know and just educate the parents a little bit. I would say you, your best bet is to spend your time educating them about how tummy time can really, it's like this helps our work so much. And this also shows the baby how to do their own work because my theory is that no baby would actually need us if every baby, every baby would do enough tummy time and do nursing. Because it's the mom that does the cranial work at this point. We're like, <laughs> getting the baby on. Now, there are, are going to be kids who have like tenacious strain and that type of thing. But if they did get enough tummy time and, they, and it's enough weight bearing and it's enough time, they'll do their own releases. It will absolutely happen. We'll work ourselves out of the job and that's a good thing. Okay? Um, what to expect? The most important thing is the parent's perception of happiness and their satisfaction. Only thing you really care about. You can get all kinds of transcranial diameter discrepancies, and that, by the way, is measuring from this point to this point, and this point to this point, and comparing them. Okay? That's all that is. Uh, but you want that. And, and one of the things you know, that I've done that's been helpful, and you know, I, I wax and bang on this, is I say, take a picture from all the different angles before I'll see the baby, you know, and, then, and then we'll take pictures afterwards, and it's notable. Mm -hmm. Or if you don't have the opportunity to take a picture right after birth, like sometime within the first 24 hours, and you'll see that strain pattern pop out in your end of the photographs. Uh, and you can do objective measurements if you want. And I think this is just like, you don't have to do that because a lot of you are in private practice and, and it's not um, it's not as big a deal. I work in a hospital and I work with doctors and we talk a certain language and I want to be able to break this work that we're doing and talk your language because it's just a, it's just a lot of um, power and cloud that I get to add to that. And that's why I'm spending my time uh, banging my head against the wall with this research project. It's good though. Um, and then you get on the table. Um, because I have a lot of days to show up with tortoise calls and pleasure stuff, and it's not a coincidence at all that I have a lot of cranial base restrictions myself. <laughs> Get on the table yourself. Um, and, and plus, if you work with babies with these, you'll, you'll take on these patterns sometimes, and we'll reflect that in the, the opposite way. Um, and we don't want to do that, but it happens sometimes. Um, use soft hands. Always, always use soft hands. Like sometimes it feels like, oh, if I can just. We don't know everything. There's so many different ways it can look. We just need to be really soft and really just be very patient and gentle with the body. And if we only get a little bit of change, that's okay. All right? And use creative, this is the last thing I'm going to say. Use creative visualization and imagery in your mind based on an anatomy that you know. So that typing here. If this is an area of growth for you, I invite you to look at the anatomy. So if you're not really good at the anatomy, just get it open. Look at there's some the tension membrane. Think of it as a peace sign if you want. When you're holding the next kid's head, like say, what's this whole thing extrapolating itself like? What's this whole thing like? Take the bones off. If I were just holding this baby with a balloon in my head, what would in my hand? What would I feel? Okay, and that's where you'll know kind of like how to follow the tissue. And it may not be exactly the bones that you're holding on to, but just anywhere in the head. Okay. You could discuss sleep patterns with the parent. I highly recommend that. And then there's ICD-9 codes. Uh, there's 767.8 for, for birth trauma. That gets reimbursed really easily. And 97140 for myofascial release and manual therapy. If any of you are into that and doing that. Okay. Questions? Thanks for letting me go over. Yes? So about treatment at birth. I have to treat an infant recently who was like 10 hours old, but it ended up being a home birth transfer and then a medicated birth, and the, you know, it's a pretty good deal. And I didn't really find anything to say on her, but she wasn't nursing because I think she was too out of it from the drugs. Yes. Is that something that, like, you might miss restrictions if yes. they're super drugged? No? Yes. Okay, so then maybe you can say, wait, maybe, and I wanted to be really positive to the mom and say, oh my gosh, your baby feels great, but then I was thinking about it later on. So, like, how much later would you have them come back to you? I've heard it can take, like, time. Yeah, and I, I always say, like, it's really great to do newborn financial therapy and it's a really beautiful thing, but they really need it when they're three to four years old. That's okay. when the strength matter starts to show up tenaciously. <laughs>
Now, any work you've done before that is going to be helpful. It's not like it's not helpful. It's definitely going to have made a difference, but you'll notice that three or four weeks is when one month usually you'll notice that it will really start happening. And if they don't have any cranial flattening by the time they're four months old, they probably won't get it. Four months, the skull goes, it seizes up like, um, ah, it's like at four months, like, it seizes up. It's, Skull, you know our skulls are diphotic, so eventually it's like, it's like a two-layered bone. But in babies, there's just little tiny ossification centers surrounded by cartilage and structures. So it's more like, you know, like the bones are in pockets of fascia. You know? Yeah? What do you tell parents who, you know, you're filled with sutures as well and everything's moving well, but they're still concerned because maybe the shape of the head isn't great? You know? So work it in the tummy time. Okay. So if you found no social restrictions, you've gone through everything. Now you're saying, well, what's the reciprocal tension membrane expressing like? And you'll, you'll still just feel an odd pattern. You'll feel it. And, and so you'll just, you'll just keep working on balancing it. And then you'll, and then you'll move to the tummy time, because that's where it'll kind of iron itself out the rest of the way. Um, as far as the codes go, is that only for people who direct work directly with insurance companies, or would it be beneficial to put a code like that on a receipt for someone who's going to try and get reimbursed from there? Yeah, insurance that's what I was talking about. Yeah. Perfect. Okay. Yeah, and the other thing, I, I they, um, in my town, um, they uh, the flexible spending accounts will, will uh, reimburse for cranial work. So, what do you tell the parents who maybe you've treated the baby with plagiocephaly four to six times, everything's moving well, but say the treatment's been done in a month and there's still that flat spot there and the mom's like still freaked out and they're doing tummy time. Like, do you have a good window of time where you're like, hey, give this so many months and, you know, do you check back in with them just to do a certain amount of hand holding for them? Yeah, I do. But it, it will change, though. Mm -hmm. There's almost no way that it won't. If they're truly getting the tummy time, they're really putting the weight on the trees and they're really listening to the head and turning it, it's not going to stay the same. Well, we see it change because we see them talk every yeah. day. But the moms that are like staring at it every day and they look at it so much, it looks, you know, yeah. they've lost like any perspective. Well, and that's a okay, well, great point is you don't want to tell the parent, you know, look, and, look and, and see if this looks less flat to you. And get them to do characteristics like, wow, they're doing like 20 minutes of tummy time now. Like, wow, they can turn their head down. Oh my gosh, do you notice how the whole ear is on the floor now? Or do you notice how when I touch the head, it's like this other, you know, the baby gets really relaxed? Bring the, the parent's attention away from the black spot on everything else. Because the black spot's not the problem. It's the compression of the tissues and the, and the, the tension, the torsion. It's actually a torsion pattern. And you'll always feel it in the neural too. It's always extrapolating it down. And these kids who like to have a persistent head tilt, it's always in the drastic. Go back down, get your checker, you know, you've got a four or five month old baby and it's got lateral rib flaring on like one side way out and it's like feels really, really rigid that you know you need to get it. You know the rest of your diaphragm is not doing anything. So therefore the cranial base isn't going to continue to release. It just won't to reflect each other. All these horizontally arranged fibers are going to affect the vertical ones. So always go back to the horizontal fibers. So go back down to the respiratory diaphragm, and back down to the pelvic respiratory diaphragm, I'll work the way back up. And you're just going to continue to clean up. It, it, it's a combination of maybe pressing with their extremities. And lifting their head is not impressive to me in tummy time. It's upper extremity weight bearing to me. Michelle, do you um, recommend, what's the dress that you recommend for the babies as, at the, as they're on tummy time? What do you want them to be wearing? Anything. You don't care. I don't want their feet open, feet on the ground, just barefoot or anything. Well, I like naked tummy time. Naked, all right. Yeah. Like put a, you know, waterproof stuff. Like, yeah. It's funny, one side of town is like the baby wearing cloth diaper and vegetarian food. <laughs> and on this over here is like the, um, you know, the richest part of town and um, just, I'm just going to go there. And so it's like big deal. And I say, you know, um, do naked tummy time over here. And he's like, yay! Yeah. And I'm just like, <laughs> <laughs> How many times? So he's like, just yeah, just put a water for a few year old thing down, a little, little possible back on the lid down. Because, you know, then I'll start talking about how, you know, the skin really needs to breathe and how, um, you know, if you're covered up in one area, it can be really hard. And so getting, and also too, the places where we have the most sensory integration is our mouth and our hands and our genitalia. Mm -hmm. It's all our feet. Mm -hmm. So to be able to get all of that in is part of mobility. 
And it's part of like the sensory awareness, like the waking up of the brain, and they was talking about like really getting these, these natural instincts <laughs> of the baby to come about. It has to be through touching, so naked or. But I, I do like the feet bare. I'm an OT though. We like bare feet. There's the biggest pores on the bottom of the feet, and the biggest nerve ending on the bottom of the feet. So we do. I, I am a reflexologist too, and I do a lot of baby reflexology. So in tummy time, we'll have this perfect place to do it as long as you can see. And you still always want to check your affect response no matter what. And you can do some reflexology and a lot of It's fun stuff. Good questions, everyone. Thanks for your attention. Thank you.